Crown of the Stars has some direct Nazi verse related connotations, but at the end of the day, I believe the best description is this. The stars, or rather star in the original Japanese name, is referencing the Earth and as such dictates who is a ruler on the Earth. This alludes to the Arthurian legend that Arthur will return as the once and future king of the Britons. Alteris features her coming to Earth. In Fate, Altera is actually an alien and this Bonsi is reminiscent of her leaving the eternal solitude of space in favor of living as a walking, living god of war. Saber Lilies is kind of interesting because it's actually showing her death. This is the scene of her corpse being taken to Avalon. The reason why Saber Lily has this as her Bonsi is that she supposedly saw her own fate play out after pulling out Caliburn from the stone, but decided to continue on that path regardless. Nero's Bonsi is her theater, the Domus Aurea, which translates to the Golden House. This was a building favored by Nero and built after the Great Fire of 64 CE. Nero actually helped design the building alongside the engineers to make sure that every detail was correct, but did not live long enough to see the project fully completed. In the Fate rendition, though, this is where her subjects would come to revel in their glorious emperor and give her the uproarious applause that she so craved. One of the things that occurred when Saber became Salter was a shift in her spirit core that seems to have accentuated the dragonic aspect of her identity. In doing so, her entire personality changed and thus she was able to harness the power of a dragon. Also something something heavens feel rude. Siegfried's Rhine Gold was the treasure that he took from the cursed dragon Fafnir. This gold was the source of a great deal of problems for the Dragon Slayer and is what inevitably led to his own death. It would later be discarded into a river in an act of sabotage, but we will get more to that once we cover the Berserkers. Caesar's commentary on the Gaelic War is one of the most well-known books in Latin and is still used today in teaching the language, for its simple and understandable word usage. The book itself includes the nine-year campaign against the Gauls written in a third-person account despite Caesar being present for them. Prelati was a supposed friend, accomplice, and possible sexual partner for Giles. Prelati himself was supposedly a warlock able to summon demons with the assistance of his spellbook, and as such, one could postulate that a demon was summoned to assist Giles in his crimes. So, this one is very likely a fabrication, but plays more into the idea that Dayon and Maria had a very good relationship, which is speculated in history and not actually a fact. However, However, let's run with the fate rendition on why this would be important for Dayon. Dayon is transgender and lived the majority of her life as a woman despite being born a male. So, assuming that Marie was aware of this fact, receiving a gift from royalty acknowledging this change in self and gender would naturally leave a lasting impact. Okita's headband, all battered and worn, is likely symbolic of how Okita died, which was alone in a near abandoned hospital in Tokyo as the Shinsengumi fled, and this headband that she likely wore throughout her time as a Shinsengumi member marks that despite her illness, she remained to fight and was sincere to the Shinsengumi until she died. For a lot of my research is turning up, there is no such thing as a druidic energy drink. However, we do know that such drinks did exist in something called Coddle, which was a warm drink that supposedly gave the consumer amazing energy and nutrition. Mordred's has no bearing in real history, and more so harkens to the conflicting nature of who Mordred is in fate. On the one hand, she loves her father and wants nothing more than for Artoria to see her as an equal. However, she's also fighting against her nature that she was given at birth to take the crown by force. So, what is captured in this Bonsi is a moment likely on the day that she died, as she contemplates who it is that she really wants to be. Note the various swords in the background belonging to the various knights of the round table. What else would Nero Bride have but a pair of wedding rings, for obvious reasons? Clearly, this is not based on historical fact, and this costume itself comes from Fate CCC. But rather, this may harken to Fate Extella, where the rings can be used to store Hakuno during battle while she gives directions. The Bay Laurel uses the basis for these rings, holds the meaning of victory and triumph, both things held very closely to Nero. Shiki's harkens back to her first encounter on a snowy night with Mikia Kokuto, who is the husband of Shiki. Rama's indestructible sword is Nandaka, the Sword of Vishnu. This blade is called the Sword of Purity and Destroyer of Ignorance, which fits nicely with the description of the Bonsi that states that his ignorance to the terror of war was shattered when he finally needed to take up his blade to free Sita. Naturally, Lancelot's CE would be his encounter with the Lady in the Lake, as it was the Lady in the Lake who raised the Orphan Knight. Fittingly, and the starter to a trend that we will continue to see is Gawain's horse, Gringolet, or Gringolot. Gringolot was the favorite steed of the knight and was said to be powerful enough to bring victory to whomever rode atop it, unless you were a Sir Kay who still lost a jousting match while borrowing the enchanted horse. Gawain personally cared for and treated his horse like it were a proper pet, and when it was eventually killed from beneath him, he went into a berserk-like rage that lasted for an entire day. If you've played all the way up through Camelot, then you already know the truth behind this one. Bedivere's arm is actually the sacred sword Excalibur, taken this form thanks to Merlin, so it may better assist Bedivere on his journey to return it. If you're wondering how he lost his real arm, in most legends he actually only lost his hand, and it was just lost in what is simply called a battle. However, he was unfettered by the loss and continued to be one of the more powerful knights of the round. Liz opened up a Halloween cafe and wants you to visit her so she gave you an invitation. That's it, that's the lore. Musashi's harkens back to the practices of Buddhism and the attempt to reach zero or emptiness. This comes from Musashi's Book of the Five Rings, which calls on the traditional five elements present in Buddhism, with void being something equated to emptiness. Once someone achieves emptiness, they are at what is said to be the jumping off point to achieve nirvana. So if you want to look at it in that light, Musashi's entire role and presence in FGO was attempting to reach enlightenment. 
I am admittedly not as brushed up on my prototype lore as I should be, so forgive me if I'm misremembering details, but this Bond CE I believe is directly from Prototype. I imagine that this is where he first meets his master Ayaka and removes his pledges of being a king to instead serve her as a knight. This is another gag Bond CE, but it's cute in a way. Tenma, who is mentioned by name in this Bond CE, is the Japanese version of Mara, who is another aspect of Kama. The basis behind the CE in particular is the demonic levels of training that Suzuka puts into attempting to score a proper master slash boyfriend. Also, she just seems to be a tad clingy with her flip phone. No real lore on this one aside from them being fresh bandages for Fran's summer form, in the event that the ones she is currently wearing get damaged. This Bond CE alludes to a tale where someone was able to deflect a sword with only two hats. The CE itself calls into question the legitimacy of this tale, but it may allude to Yagyu's hereditary book of the art of war, in which he has an entire section dedicated to knowing how to defeat someone when you are unarmed, mostly by using the environment to your advantage. This one is a mixture of comedy and real lore fitting together like a snug puzzle. The congealed wisdom wording may be chosen purposefully as the wisdom Sigurd gained was thanks to the congealed blood of the dragon Fafnir that he bathed in. As to why they are glasses, it's because Bryn thinks that he looks hot with them on. If you cleared Summer 3, then you will recognize this is Maeve's album of her pictures taken at the Lulahawa beach. Supposedly, the photos in it are good enough to win her the prize in all but the final loop. Diramid possessed two different sets of swords and spears that he used for various occasions. He would always bring one sword and one spear. However, manifesting with his two swords, Source, translated to mean the Great Fury and Little Fury, they are now his Bond CE. He received the Great Fury Moral Talk from Monin McLear as a gift which was always able to cleanly cleave its target. He received the Little Fury Bagel Talk from his foster father Angus Og. Lan Lang's Bond CE is the mask that he actually wore in battle and the cup of poison he used to kill himself. The tale of Lan Lang wearing the mask into battle was true, though it was a much more horrifying mask than the one that Faye presents us with. This is because by all accounts, Lan Lang appeared to be a beautiful woman. As for why Lan Lang killed himself, his cousin had become the Emperor and after a passing comment made by Lan Ling about familial affairs, the new emperor became paranoid. Lan Ling avoided confrontation with the emperor out of respect and possible fear for his life, but one day he was sent a cup of poison in order to kill himself. And so he did. Shortly after, the entire Gao line, because remember Lan Ling's real name is Gao Chonggong, was wiped out by the Zhao as Lan Ling was their best general. This is one where we get hit by some of the real sad shit. What is depicted here is Benny Enma laying down her sword in what can presumably be the grave of the woodcutter who saved her, a small grave in the mountains where she can enjoy the springtime with one of the only humans she ever came to trust, or at least the memory of them. The CE is meant to invoke a sense of ennui for a long time ago and a memory to be treasured. Keeping up with the depressing atmosphere, we have Lakshmi Bai's. Depicted is the place of her death, Gwalier, which I'm absolutely saying wrong. She was overrun by the royal army and killed unceremoniously after being knocked off her horse, where she was then shot with a carbine. The CE, however, calls upon the aftermath, which was the raging spirit of vengeance, which would eventually repel the forces of Britain. Oh no, we're still sad boys, so let's keep going. This one is titled At Dream's End and shows the wreckage of the Argo. So here's where myth and the current presentation of things are slightly different. The Bon CE shows the wreckage of what is probably the aftermath of a storm, but the actual Argo, after its adventures, was deemed a sacred item and placed under Poseidon's protection. Jason continued to live on the desecrated ship alone, no longer with a purpose. He was then crushed by a falling beam, or in some tellings, the figurehead of Hera, the goddess of marriage, which is present in the Bon CE. So if you were to lift up that statue of Hera just off the beach, you could probably see a little crushed Jason underneath it. After this, the Argo would then be added to the constellations. This is a real work known as the Chinsetsu Yumi Harazuki that was written by Takazawa Baikin with illustrations by Hokusai. The story featured Minamoto no Tametomo, who was the uncle of Ushiwakamaru. Why this was chosen as her bonsi is kind of beyond me, but it alluded to two different servants that were going to be showing up soon, which kind of stays in theme with her because her outfit also predicted several of the future Kuroboshi foreigner designs. Saber Astolfos is less of anything of historical merit and more of a declaration of love for the master and desire to always be by their side. Leaving the sword for a moment, as the CE is called, has the secondary meaning of allowing oneself to be vulnerable. Also in the bonsi's description, Astolfo says the words throbbingly. For Bond tending the Diascuri, you receive their weapons, or more so an explanation of what their weapons are. They are a sword wielded by Pollux and a discus wielded by Castor. The more interesting thing with these descriptions is the explicit mention that both are made of Adamus. Adamus is better known as Adamant, which is a fictional metal that is used to describe a malleable kind of diamond. Other fictional things that were made of Adamant are Cronus' Scythe, the very same that cut off Saturn's balls, the Gates of Tartarus, and Adamant is used to bind Satan in Hell in Milton's Paradise Lost. Tomoe gives to us her VR headset. Created by a member of Caldea's staff from Blueprints in the database, this set is compatible with almost every available console and permits the use of single and dual hand combat ability. This was Tomoe's favorite form of relaxation during the Genpei War probably, and also it was confirmed in her Valentine's lines that they have H games that she's probably played. Saito's is one of the most depressing things I've ever read, and in a sense it's glorious. What is seen is his old police uniform from after the Shinsengumi. Saito was one of the few members of the corpse to survive, and as such carries the memories of his former comrades. The CE is meant to show Saito reflecting on his old days as a corpse member, and
and wondering if all of his comrades got what they really wanted in the end. The most painful part of this one is that it has a strong basis in real history and is likely a thought that did plague the real Saito up until the day that he died. Watanabe's requires you to have cleared High and Kyo to be fully understood. Fate is doing a bit of a fill in the blanks with Suna because his actual history is kind of a mystery. We know that he existed, or at least is attested to having existed, but his personal affairs and childhood are not really discussed. What Fate did was color in that picture with the knowledge that we do have, that being that Suna was the most lethal Oni Slayer amongst Raiko's four retainers. Suna's bond to depicts him coming back to his home to see an Oni has killed his entire family, including the girl that he loved. Plot twist, the girl that he loved actually became the Oni who killed everyone, and that girl was none other than her very own Ibaraki, which just kind of throws a wrench into their weird, cute, kill each other dynamic. Ibuki bestows upon us the Kusanagi no Surugi, the sword that was claimed by the sea god Susano after severing the tail of Yamata no Orochi, and would later be used as an offering to Amaterasu to smooth over a previous dispute the pair had about killing the Harvest God. As to the major importance of this sword, it is considered to be one of Japan's three sacred treasures along with the mirror Yata no Kagami and the jewel Yasakani Magatama. This sword's connection with Ibuki comes from her relationship to Yamata no Orochi, as well as her own level of divinity. Fun side fact, supposedly humans are not to look upon the sacred sword directly unless given permission, and at one point a bunch of priests caught a glimpse of it and all but one of them died shortly after from an unknown disease. Karna gets his champion's belt from being a champion Santa. There isn't really any IRL lore to this, because it's literally a man pretending to be Santa and touting a victory belt as if he didn't have class advantage against his opponent for the final bout. Muramasa is a masterpiece of a sword that he gifts to the master as a memento of the time spent together. While this should go without saying, the historical Muramasa was one of Japan's most famous swordsmiths. Now, the act of giving a sword or a knife as a gift is seen in many cultures to be a sign of bad luck, and a sword or knife given as a gift is often given with a coin strapped to it to symbolically be given back to purchase the blade. However, in Muramasa's time, this act would have been a way to impress or please their lord. This is one that has its lore all centered around FGO, save for the fact that she's making meat pies. Bargas has the hobby of cooking and is so pleased of having gotten a master who she considers to be her partner that she's pouring wifely love into each monstrously sized dish for you to eat. What a cutie. Okita Alters is another FGO-centric one with a gift of two swords that make up the one talking sword, Rengoku. Rengoku is of course the child next to Okita there. What this bond CE serves to explain to us is that the two swords are actually two halves of the same whole, and when combined they are more powerful. Also, there's an implication here that Okita wants to serve us for the remainder of our lives. The Trunk Sisters' baby elephants are given as a gift here, or rather a scene of one of the Trunk Sisters playing with the baby elephants. The game itself remarks that it doesn't exactly know what they are, but makes the comment that they have the eyes of quote-unquote everybody who supported them. The significance of the elephants to the Trunk Sisters comes from them often being depicted riding war elephants into battle, and the sisters themselves are considered to be a symbol of Vietnamese nationalism and freedom. Elephants historically have been an influential part of Vietnamese culture, and religion is a symbol of strength and war, so combining freedom and strength together makes this gift all the more meaningful. Charlemagne's sword, Joyeuse, which I'm absolutely saying wrong because I'm not French, is the prize for taking him to Bon 10. You can actually see the sword on display at the Louvre if you're in need of a Charlie Catalyst. Legend states that part of the spear Longinus was placed into the hilt of this blade and that it was made of the same material as Roland's Durandal. So through and through, it's a holy sword that you can actually see. It was also used in the coronation of the French monarchy for a time, and a town of the same name supposedly got the name because the sword was lost in battle and a knight went and retrieved it, and Charlie gifted him land that became the town. And what is by far the funniest Bond CE, we have Roland's naked ass. This is from the ever-famous tale of Roland losing his mind and stripping himself naked and attacking people at random. Essentially, he became a wild man with mythical strength and was only eventually calmed down by Astolfo returning his sanity to him, which he found on the moon because all things that are lost end up on the moon. You may be fooled into believing at first glance that this broken blade is that of Sir Gawain, but rather it is the sword of the Red Knight, Sir Ironside, who appears in Garrett's legend, where she sets off to prove herself worthy of her knightly lineage. As opposed to the fate rendition of Sir Ironside being a manifestation of calamity, in myth, he's rather a knight with the strength of seven men, who fights because he has sworn to his lady to kill Sir Lancelot. Garrett spares Sir Ironside and he eventually joins the Round Table Knights. Finally, we have Yamanami. Yamanami is another tearjerker one because what you're seeing right here is the very last thing that Yamanami himself saw. This is a seppuku dagger, and the thoughts running through his head in the Bonsi are his prayers for his fellow members of the Corps. The reason why he has to commit seppuku is because he broke the tenet of the Shinsengumi to not leave. I have an entire video on the subject, so go check it out. But the long and the short of it is that Yamanami's views of the Shinsengumi had soured for one reason or another, and he decided to defect. The Shinsengumi sent Okita after him when they found out that he was missing, knowing Yamanami would not hurt Okita, as Okita was like a younger brother to him. When he was brought back, several members wanted to help him get away, but he resigned himself to his fate. Thus was the tragic death of Yamanami Keisuke. Emiya's Bonsi is simply recounting the tale of his current status in life. Emiya became a member of the counterforce in the hopes of being able to save as many lives as possible. However, he was instead made into a simple tool to wipe out people who whom the force seemed to be threats to humanity. The CE attempts to encapsulate that feeling of bitterness that he feels, but keeps his continued will to keep trying. Gilgamesh shows us his key to the Gate of Babylon. This is a deviation from real history, naturally. The key is a constantly changing object that only 
Gilgamesh himself can use to open the gates of Babylon. The gates themselves grew notorious enough for them to become a mystic and gradually accumulate more and more treasure. Even if Gil were kind enough to give you the key to access the vault, you wouldn't be able to because you don't know how to actually open it, so it would just be as useful as a stone. Adelanta's Bonsi is the Golden Apples. During the foot race for her hand in marriage, Aphrodite gave the apples to Hippomenes, who then used them to slow down Atalanta. This is what would eventually lead to her marriage, but for one reason or another, depending on which myth you are reading, Atalanta and Hippomenes are turned into male and female lions because the Greeks believed that they would not be able to have sex then. Robin's Bonsi is his noble phantasm, no face, may king. While you can be forgiven for thinking that this name sequence is just a translation error that they've just kind of run with, it is actually grammatically correct. The no faces aspect is explained in the Bonsi itself, saying that he wore the hood to hide his face and that the role of being Robin Hood was one that was passed from person to person. As such, there is no singular face, or face at all, for the Robin Hood name. The May King is actually about the May Day Festival. Normally, there's a crowning of a May Queen, but there are sometimes May Kings. But as this is a celebration of nature, and Robin himself is viewed as an aspect of nature, he takes up the role of being the king of the natural world, the May King. Thus, he is the no-face May King. Uriel's and Steno's, for that matter, have no basis in history at all. Both are simply manifestations of their weapon of choice. In the case of Uriel, is a golden bow not dissimilar to the bow of Cupid. The reasoning for that is because of her godly charm, said to be able to captivate even the most cold-hearted of men. Naturally, Arash has ties to the meteor that he supposedly became that shot across the night sky. The issue is that how it is presented in the CE is that there are seven lights in the sky instead of just Arash, with the flavor text being Arash feeling confused on the subject. Now, Arash is difficult enough to get research done on as is, because he is very much a local hero, but the seven colors across the night sky may be representative of a rainbow. This is because the rainbow was seen as the bow of the pre-Islamic god Kaza. So what that may allude to in this sea is that Arash's prayers were heard and that he became the arrow of the god to save his nation. Orion's Bonsi is a stellar tri-star belt. After Orion was killed, be it by poisoning or accidentally by Artemis, Orion's body was committed to the stars by Zeus, where it became the constellation we now know as Orion the Hunter. I would reckon that as far as constellations go, this one, the Pleiades, and the Dippers are the most famous. David gives to you the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark is one of the most fascinating things in the Bible for several reasons, but partially because we are given the exact instructions on how to make it, down to the measurements and adornings. The Ark itself housed the sacred tablets of the Ten Commandments, and anyone who touched the Ark without the Lord's permission was directly smoted by him. When the Ark itself was captured by the Philistines, not but misfortune fell upon the places where it was brought. In an act of defiance against God, they left the Ark in the temple of the deity Dagon before a statue. When they returned the following morning, the statue was prostrated in front of the Ark, and soon after the plague took many of the people of the city. At present, we do not know where the Ark is, but we can assume that a holy vessel called the Ark of the Covenant did actually exist. The real Ark would become lost to history around 570 BCE after the Babylonians ransacked Jerusalem. It is still debated whether the Ark was taken to Babylon or if it was hidden away and just simply lost to time. Nobu's is a combination of her own gun of choice, the matchlock, and the influence that it had. Nobu is the one who essentially made the case that guns are not just useful on the battlefield, but the next step in warfare altogether. At the time, guns were viewed as a powerful weapon for sure, but one that took too long to reload and became virtually useless up close. As such, the debate as to whether guns or bows were superior raged on even during Musashi's time around 60 years later, with Musashi remarking that each had a place on the battlefield. Nobu's ambition and willingness to attempt to revolutionize Japanese warfare tactics clearly paid off and firearms became a mainstay in Japanese warfare ever since. No, Tesla did not invent and use a real-life Infinity Gauntlet. This is supposed to be a representation of the great deed that Tesla did, in becoming the modern Prometheus bringing not fire, but electricity from the heavens and giving it to mankind. I have a few gripes about this claim, which fate touts a lot, because the history of the discovery and utilization of electricity involves a shit ton of people, but for now, I'll let it slide. I'm still not as brushed up on the Mahabharata as I should be, so forgive me for leaving out details. Arjuna was born into royalty, and as such, led the life of a royal. He had all that he could possibly ask for, a great amount of wealth, and several beautiful brides, yet he still wanted more and took several risks that could have gotten him killed or slandered his family's name for what seems to be like his own enjoyment. I don't know exactly which event in his life the sea is referring to, but his risk taking as a whole will have to suffice for now. This one's kind of a fan service for those of you who have played Hollow Ataraxia because in it, Kid Gill is the owner and manager of Waku Waku Zabun, or as it is translated into English, Exciting Splash Water Park. I love Buildies because it has the duality to it being both cinematic and historically accurate. The best way to view the CE is as follows. This CE and its description is the closing scene to the Billy the Kid movie. The opening scene is the historically accurate one that goes as follows. Billy was at a saloon when he got into an argument with a man named Francis Cahill, who was known to be a bully to Billy. Cahill struck up an argument with Billy, who in turn insulted him, leading to the pair fighting and winding up on the floor. In a last-ditch effort to get the much larger man off of him, Billy managed to get his revolver and shot Cahill before fleeing. This was the first of the 21 people that he'd killed during his life. The ending of Tristan's life is a bit complex, so I'm going to attempt to keep it short here. There are two Isolates, who I'm absolutely saying wrong in this story. It is the Irish healer Isolate and Tristan's wife wife Isolate of the White Hands. Tristan had been poisoned by a lance while fighting six knights, and the only one who could cure it was 
Eastlet the Irish healer. So he sent a friend of his to go and get her in return with white sails if Eastlet was with them and black sails if she was not. As Tristan was in so much pain, he couldn't get up from his bed to see the colors of the sails, so he asked his wife, Eastlet of the White Hands, to tell him what color the sails were. She was jealous of the Irish Eastlet and so lies to Tristan about the colors of the sails, which were white, claiming that they were black. Tristan dies of a broken heart believing that he has been betrayed, and when the Irish Eastlet sees that she was too late, she dies on top of his corpse. After the defeat of the demonic centipede, the dragon god of the lake was so overjoyed that she gifted Toyota with a number of magical items. These included a bolt of silk that never ran out and was of the finest quality, a bag of rice that was always full of the most delicious rice, and a red copper pan that always cooked delicious meals. The most notable among these are his rice bag, which he became famous for because instead of hoarding the gift that he received, he shared them with the people around him so that they could rejoice in his good fortune with him. This is why Toda is the Chad of Chads in Caldea. Archer Artorias is a trophy stylized in the form of a penguin and similar to a holy grail. According to the description, Artoria got obsessed with Water Blitz, a survival game on the beach, and won this cup for being the best at it. When did this happen during the events of Summer 1? No clue. Supposedly this occurred in Hawaii on Waikiki Beach, so maybe it has alluded to Summer 3 all along? I have no idea. This is just Anne and Mary going off to use the beach showers. The bond CE is that they try to drag you into it, but because that's kind of boring to be the only lord, did you know that pirates rarely bathed and then when they did it was with seawater and used almost exclusively on their private? This is the shared pain spell applied to Chloe in Prisma Ilia by Rin. Chloe was attempting to kill Ilya so that she could change places with her, so the spell made us that any harm that came to Ilya would be applied to Chloe as well. The likely reason for why this is the bond is because it represents the bond between the two sisters or something. Ishtar's poses a bit of a problem to me. My research is turning up nothing at all for a sacred warhammer. It really doesn't even appear in any of her iconography either, and it isn't mentioned in any of the texts I'm currently looking at. What I did find instead is that serpents, or rather snakes, are what is most important in this motif. Gilgamesh has an aversion to snakes due to one snacking away the herb of immortality away from him, so the decision to use snakes works on that angle. The other one is that it may be representative of, of Musmahu, the seven-headed serpent of Sumerian myth that was slain by the hero Ninurata. Moriarty's is his best-selling book of mathematics titled The Dynamics of an Asteroid. The book was essentially Moriarty's magnum opus and hailed as being so mathematically impeccable that no critics were able to find any faults with it. Never forget that Moriarty's true evil comes from his understanding of algebra. Emya Alter gives us an explanation as to what his guns are, in Kansho and Bakuya respectively. The original swords were Archer Emya's weapons of choice and were covered in spells of warding to increase their effect in this. Here, Emya Alter has thrown away his feelings of favorites and altered his swords into firearms, which are capable of firing broken phantasms. According to himself, he doesn't care what weapons he uses so long as he can do the job. HPB Archer gives us the modified version of the minigun Nyarf, which was made originally as a magical weapon by Edison and Tesla. The version that we are given was made so that even a normal human being like us could fire it. So Tomoe is sad and tragic in its own way. What is presented are the possible paths that Tomoe took after her husband told her to leave him to die during the Genpei War. The first incarnation is the one where she did leave him, who becomes a nun and then eventually a spirit that wept at the loss of her husband. The second incarnation is the one in which she stayed and fought regardless, dying with her burning love for her husband beside him. The third incarnation, I think, is the one that we see before us right now, who actually knows what happened and remembers the events vividly, but plans to keep them a secret. The God of Winter and Sheep, Altera the Santa's Bond CE, is more fan service than anything. It shows the exact same streak that she appeared as when entering Earth, but is defined as being a shooting star to wish upon. I don't have the time to explain exactly why the CE is so tragic, so I'll break it down to you like this. Cardinal Kyokai Diehards, please forgive me for this gross oversimplification of an incredibly tragic character. Fujino was born with teleconnect abilities, but her dad thought that they were too dangerous for modern society, and so gave her a bunch of pills to suppress them, which had the overdosing effect that suppressed her pain receptors. The submarine itself on the bridge held a special memory that she had for her senpai who helped her when she had sprained her ankle, and the significance of the rain comes back into play close to the end of her story in K&K, &K, which I highly recommend that you go and watch for yourself because it is fucking sad. Chirons is reminiscent of his own legends and myth as the great teacher of heroes. It remarks on the oldest adage of teaching that exists, that being that you never stop learning. Regardless of what you do, you will learn something from the experience, even if what you learn is just infinitesimal. Napoleon's is a mixture of real-life quandary and how rumor affects servants in the Fate universe. Everyone who knows about Napoleon knows that there are a handful of lies told about him that are spread as propaganda, the most well-known one being that he was short. However, certain parts of his legends and rumors seem to have shaped Napoleon during its manifestation as a servant. The real question with this is, then what makes this Napoleon the real Napoleon? The game offers no explanation for this. Summer Johns is her beloved dolphins that she insists are sea angels and is trying to actively arm with stolen armor armor and weapons from other servants. Yes, that is true. However, dolphins themselves could be seen as similar to angels in the way that the Valkyrie are, because the ancient Greeks considered them to be the messengers of the gods. The eulogized shot of William Tell, a mark against tyranny since the 14th century. Tell was from the town of Uri, and one day passed the town of Altdorf, Switzerland, which had been taken over by the tyrannical man, Gessler. To make sure that all in the town vowed loyalty to him, he hung his hat from the tree and made everybody who entered the town bow before it. Tell and his son Walter refused to do so, and as so, were arrested. 
Gessler offered them freedom, only if Tell could shoot an apple off of Walter's head. Tell managed to do so, but then Gessler noticed that he had taken out two bolts for the shot. Initially reluctant, it took Gessler promising not to kill Tell or his son to say that if he had missed, he had planned to kill Gessler with it. Gessler then tried to give him a life sentence, but this isn't an episode behind the servant, so I'm going to stop there. Also, I found that the first instance of the story is written by Hans Schlieber from Landscriber, and it made me laugh. Alright, so Ashes is kind of weird. First off, let me give a thank you to Prahashara in the Discord for helping me out with this one as best that he could. The connection between Ash and the Chakram, which is likely meant to be the Sudarshana Chakram, is near non-existent. This Chakram is a favorite weapon of Vishnu, but in the Mahabharata, it is wielded by the 8th avatar of Vishnu, Krishna. Krishna's connection with Ash is that Krishna is the one who cursed him with immortality and removed the gem from his head that caused it to always ooze a foul-smelling liquid for eternity. So perhaps the best way to look at this CE is less of him trying to claim the treasure of godhood, but rather him trying to claim forgiveness for his actions. This would make sense in tone with the rest of his CE's description, where he takes the stance of wanting to be a protector rather than an attacker, which he absolutely was in the Mahabharata. Paris's Bond CE is a flashback of what would eventually become the start of the Trojan War. The war began out of an argument between Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena over who was the most beautiful. This came about because they neglected to invite the god Eris, the goddess of strife, to a celebration, so she threw a golden apple of strife at them that had the words, for the most beautiful, etched on it. They eventually came to realize that arguing among deities was going to get them nowhere, so they brought in an unrelated third party, the fair and honest youth, Paris. Here he had to make a decision without a right answer, please one goddess in anger to others. So, as the name of the CE says, he ought to think carefully. Not much really to go on here other than to relive the days of procrastination and the realization that battles come in many shapes and forms. From games to manga deadlines, the battles never truly stop. Chains is weird in its own right. The cheerleader thing is more a fetish bait than anything else, but the real historical value comes from the description of the CE. Jane in history was a bit of a vagabond. She traveled from place to place, never truly settling down, and eventually died doing what she loved, drinking. So if nothing else, we can determine that at least a grain of history is in this Servant Verse rendition of her. Also go watch my video on her. Nothing here holds any historical weight as I have come to accept from Santa servants. This one is kind of fun though because it plays on the idea that Nightingale's neglecting to acknowledge her part as Santa. She's instead playing it all off as though it were a dream. I don't have much more to say on this one because it's exactly the same as the Artemis Orion one, just without the Ursa Minor painted over it. Says is cute and not just for how it looks. Says' famed work, The Pillow Book, was essentially a journal marking the daily lives of court life during the Heian era of Japan. It was somewhat mundane and included the gossips around the court and the like, which from a historical perspective is amazing to have documentation of. It's something so small, like how we record our friends and family. Here we see Say doing that once again, but in a revamped modern version of it. Some things will always be the same. Ilias Bonsi is a snippet of the summer event we spent with her, where she became the star of the show for having the best panic expressions in the entire game. This Bonsi celebrates that fact by having Ruby swap out the cute magical girl anime out with a slasher flick. Ruby is weirdly persistent about getting Ilya to watch it. Ruby is really weird as a character. Nobukatsu features a singular red spider lily. The red spider lily is symbolic of death. Fittingly, it makes an appearance on most of Nobu's art in the game, as well as around a certain portent of death, no not that one this one. The flower was placed on the grave of Nobukatsu and his death is meant to symbolize the start of Nobu's rampage through Japan. While I'm sure there is something more to this one that it will be explained in Lost Belt 6, the real fascination with shoes likely comes from Sith actually not having feet. The original Banshee, had goat hooves, so Sith finding something pretty that could be worn to hide her feet falls in line with her personality a bit. Nothing of historical relevance here, Anastasia just wants to be spoiled by you and pretend to be a couple. It's more of a desire for the future or a scene from the summer event that we didn't actually get to see. After Zenobia's failed attempt to rebel against the oppression of the Roman Empire, she was taken as a trophy to be marched in the streets in chains of gold. She was paraded through the streets of many Roman cities with these chains and then eventually would die in captivity shortly after. Go watch my video on her in Boudicca for more information. Tame Tomo is infamous for the anecdote that comes from the Hogan Monogatari. In it, he is described as having a left arm longer than the right one, either by four or five inches depending on the account, enabling him to fire a bow much stronger. Tame Tomo was being hunted at one point by the Imperials and was discovered on an island that he had taken refuge on. He thought that he was not strong enough to resist them, so he stabbed his son to death to prevent his capture, and then wanted to fire a final arrow at his enemies. He knocked it and sunk an entire ship in one blow. This actually scared off the Imperials from chasing him for some time. We start off with Ku's Bonsi-E, the shooting star of prophecy. While I can't exactly find anything on seeing an actual meteor, there was a prophecy about Ku's life that this was trying to mirror. After he had slain the dog of Kulin and become Ku Kulin, Ku overheard a prophecy being told by the druid Koth Bob that any warrior who took up arms on a certain day would gain everlasting fame. So, the little Ku, at only seven years old, rushed to the king Konkabar and asked for weapons. The only one that could withstand his strength was the king's very own weapon, and Ku took it and returned to Koth Bob. However, Ku had left before hearing the whole prophecy that while the warrior would gain everlasting fame, 
fame, they would die young. This is why you should always read your contracts. I am certain that there is something more to the CE than meets the eye, so I'm going to do some theory crafting instead. Despite its color, I would have to be convinced that this elixir was in fact a vial of Liz's blood. This is because historically, Liz bathed in the blood of maidens to keep her own appearance young, and this would also play into the idea that she has the genetics of a dragon, whose blood also is said to have healing properties. So unless this is a reference to Fate Extra that is completely going over my head, that is as about as close to historical accuracy as I think I can get with Liz. Benkei's is none other than his famous encounter with Ushiwakamaro at the Gojo Bridge. Benkei was on a mission to collect the swords of 1,000 warriors that he had defeated in battle. He had defeated 999 and came across Ushi playing a flute at a shrine. Benkei challenged him to a fight for his sword and Ushi agreed but asked that they fight away from the temple. They took it to the bridge and Ushi defeated Benkei. Benkei would challenge Ushi again the next night and lose once more and then decided to pledge his service to Ushi, thus leading him down the path that he took for the rest of his life. So, I mentioned this story earlier, but Kuhlin gets his nickname from the infamous Hound of Kulin that he killed as just a child. King Konkabar saw Ku playing hurling and was so impressed by his performance that he offered to have the boy join him for a feast at Kulin's home. Ku agreed to come, but only after he had finished the game, so the king went on alone to Kulin's. Konkabar forgot to tell Kulin about Ku coming along later, and so he let out his massive guard dog. When Ku made it to Kulin's house, he was attacked by the massive dog but managed to beat it and kill it. Kulin was devastated by the loss of his dog, so Ku told him that he would act as his guard dog until Kulin could raise a new one. Hence, how he got the name Ku, Kulin, or the Hound of Kulin. This may be the hardest one that I'm going to have to cover because it's quite literally nothing. It's just called Rome, and it's just the helmet that Romulus wears that he didn't wear in history. So instead, I will answer a question that may have crossed your mind in the past regarding Rome, which is why is it associated with the color red? Well, this is for a few reasons. Rome's patron deity was Mars, who is also associated with red, but Rome goes further by naturally associating red with blood as well as with courage. The Hot Gates is one that likely doesn't need an introduction because it lives in infamy, so I'll tell the story in brief. Leonidas led a force of 300 Spartans, 700 Thespians, and 400 Thebians in a last stand against the army of the Persian ruler Xerxes. It had been prophesied the Sparta would fall unless a Spartan king died, and so Leonidas stood with his men in the area of Thermopylae against suicidal odds. Fittingly, it was believed that Thermopylae was a gate to Hades, so they would literally be fighting on Death's Door. The much smaller Greek force managed to hold off the Persian invaders for three days thanks to superior weapon technology and terrain advantage, and this holdout is believed to be what turned the tides of war and allowed Greece to emerge victorious. What is depicted here are the famed Shining Helmet of Hector and his weapon Durandal. Hector was famed for having a Shining Helm, and so it seemed a bit odd that it would be absent altogether from his design in FGO. I may have an explanation for that. During Hector's last visit with his wife and son, the shine off of Hector's helmet frightened the boy and caused him to cry. This can be taken as a bad omen for the future, and so Hector prays to Zeus to make his son into a great warrior before setting off. The Bonsi itself muses that the weapon and armor should be practical over showy, possibly to reflect this, no pun intended. So Fate has done this thing where they took Skahawk and made her into an OC. Skahawk is an incredibly minor character in the Ulster Cycle, serving more so as another teacher of Ku more than anything else. As such, the Land of Shadows, aka Don Skoth, is equally unexplored or fleshed out. It should be noted that it is not an actual underworld like Hades, but rather something closer to Limbo. You can actually visit Dunscoth Castle and the Land of Shadows as the ruins of the castle still stand today in Scotland. A knight's pledge to his king is one seen as nearly absolute. Diarmid's oath to Fionn and the Red Branch Knights was no different. However, the musing on the sea is how he would come to betray his king in a way. After Fionn was an old man, he sought to marry a young maiden named Gron. She didn't want to marry someone who could have been her grandfather and so opted to try and seduce one of his knights. This knight would be Diarmid. While initially reluctant, he was essentially cursed to help her and ran away with her, knowing that this would likely lead to her death. This betrayal would result in them both being hunted down, but I will save the rest for the Diarmid video that I'm working on. There is no historical precedent in the transformation of King Arthur into an aspect of the Wild Hunt, but if you are interested in that at all, I recommend checking out this video. For now though, the sea is meant to explain the difference between Lancer Altar and Artoria Lancer. Lancer Altar usurped the power of the Lance Wrong Mediad and chose to remain herself as opposed to Artoria Lancer, who allowed herself to become the goddess of the Lance. This CE is not directly related to Karna, as it instead tells of a parable of what makes life happy. Karna is a complicated figure in myth. He is described as being a genuinely good person, even sacrificing his own immortality for others by giving up his earrings and armor. Karna often gave away his own possessions to others to help them without thinking of the damage that it could do to himself. Much like the old beggar in this parable, Karna sought to give all that he could for it being the right thing to do, as opposed to showing off how generous he was. What else could Fionn's be but the famed Salmon of Knowledge? The tale goes like this. A wise old man named Finn spent seven years attempting to catch the Salmon of Knowledge, and finally managed to do so. He gave it to his servant boy, Fionn MacCumhale, to prepare for him to eat, but was told that he mustn't eat any of it. 
Fionn did as he was told, but burnt his thumb on some boiling fat and sucked on it to ease the pain. This gave him all of the knowledge of the salmon. When Finn saw that Fionn had gained the knowledge, he asked him if he had eaten any of the salmon. Fionn denied this and explained what had happened. Finn realized that it was not his fate to gain this knowledge, so he gave the rest of the salmon to Fionn to eat, who ever after could draw upon all the world's knowledge by biting his thumb. Brynhild's Bonsi is meant to symbolize her suicide. After she killed Sigurd, she was so overcome with grief at the loss that she threw herself upon his funeral pyre, and thus the two ashes mingled together, which is romantic in a very morbid sort of way. The CE seems to indicate that Bryn still feels those flames even now. The life of Li Xuan is fascinating. He is someone who devoted the entirety of his life to training in the martial arts and then teaching them. This CE speaks of how he was never satisfied with his abilities, and up until he eventually was killed, he continued to sharpen his skills. So from what I am turning up, Dun Stallion is not a name, but rather a descriptor for the horse. Dun is this color in equestrian terms, and a stallion is an uncastrated male horse. As such, this horse is not Lamrey, who is a mare, but rather Arthur's second horse, Hengrun. At present, I can't find any legends around this particular horse, but it took me an unnecessarily long amount of time to figure out if Dun Stallion was a third horse that existed, and it's not. As we have seen, and will continue to see, Summer Bonsi's hold almost no bearing in history the majority of the time. Though if I were to go for a stretch, we could make a reference to the setting sun in the sun motif at all as a reference to Tamamo's roots of being an aspect of Amaterasu in fate. That said, no such connection exists in history for this more appealing Heineken commercial. Kyo's is a perfect encapsulation of how much of a psycho Kyohime actually is. Across the entire beach, she has written the phrase, Aishtemas, which means, I love you. However, due to her own overworking of herself, some of the letters have become muddled and she is clearly exhausted, unable to read them in the correct order. So, this CE likely takes place during Vlad's imprisonment in Hungary. He was captured and imprisoned and then subsequently framed for conspiracy in order for the Hungarians to take power. When questioned by the Pope why they had imprisoned someone who the church was personally sponsoring against the campaigns of Mehmed II, the Hungarians forged three documents claiming that Vlad would side with the Muslims if they would restore his throne. Thus, Vlad sat in prison for 14 years and his faith became tempered by this time. Jalter Lily's Door to the Ocean is a pseudo-fate invention based on possible real-life events? Kind of. Jalter Lily has one wish, as it is something that normal Jean would supposedly never manage to do, and that was to see the ocean. The veracity of this claim is up in the air, but it makes for a sweet CE. Here are the alternatives if we want to explore more about the CE because it mentions that the door here could take you anywhere, and that she read it in a sci-fi novel, kind of. My first thought is that this is more akin to the Doraemon Anywhere door that took her there. A commenter on the fandom page pointed out that the door may be referencing a sci-fi novel called The Door Into Summer, which which involves using time travel to age yourself up for certain reasons that might make Jailter uncomfortable. Both are a stretch, but they both exist. Another major deviation in history occurs in this CE, and Kidu's Flowers of Humbaba. Humbaba is often described as being a demon, but also a lone protector of the cedar forest who is very gullible. In the forest, Humbaba has various auras that make him invulnerable, so Gilgamesh and Enkidu decide to trick him by offering him bribes. These include a bride and a concubine, as well as the goods found in civilization. Humbaba agrees and gives up his auras and is then attacked by Gil. Humbaba pleads for mercy, saying that he has always lived alone and wishes to be spared. Gil asks Enkidu if they should show mercy for the poor wretch, and Enkidu promptly decapitates him. So with that said, the CE painting this interaction in a light where Enkidu felt that they were kindred spirits is far from accurate. Lil Dusa's Bon CE is the clothing that she she wishes that she could have worn for her immortal life, a matching outfit to her sisters Steno and Uriel. However, as we know, Medusa was different for some reason or another and continued to grow larger, leading her to eventually be assaulted and transformed into the monstrous Gorgon, who would then eat her beloved sisters. This should go without saying, but this is a fate fabrication. I would like to give a shout out to the thesis paper The Fire and the Jaguar, which I will have linked below for this. Taiga's Bonsi is the primeval flame. In many traditions of South America, the Jaguar was a Prometheus-esque figure that gave fire to humanity. The one specifically mentioned in the Bonsi comes from the Ge of Brazil. Summarized, humans originally ate foul things like rotten wooden fungus and could only heat their food by leaving little bits of meat on rocks to get warm. One day, a boy breaks his sister's husband's hand with a rock while getting macaw chicks to eat and is left in the macaw nest on the cliff. He is rescued by a jaguar who takes him home and treats him as a son. At the jaguar's house, the jaguar's wife has a fire going, but she seems to dislike the boy for being both skinny and ugly. The next day, the jaguar male leaves and tells his wife to give the boy whatever cooked meat he wants when he asks. When the boy asks, the wife tells him to get different meat, but the boy takes the one that he wants instead. The wife scares the boy and he runs off. This happens for a few more days until the male jaguar gives the boy a bow and says to kill his wife if she does it again, and then to leave for his village. The male jaguar also warns his wife, but the events unfold as they did before, and the boy kills her. 
He then takes the fire used for cooking, the bow, and many other things to the village and teaches them how to make fire and cook food with this. Thus, humanity no longer had to eat foul things. This one actually explains itself fairly well within the text of the Bonsai. Raiko didn't have a horse called Kyogoku, but rather it is named after the Nio Kyogoku, which I am not finding in any research. Given the kanji present in the Japanese text, I'm assuming that this was a treaty formed between the Minamoto and Fujiwara clans. It should go without saying that bulls hold a special meaning in Hinduism and are viewed as divine animals. While there are several parables about Parvati and her bull, I'm going to go with one. One day Parvati and Shiva went for a ride on a bull. Shiva took the form of an old man, and Parvati stayed her beautiful self. Parvati rode at first, and Shiva walked alongside her. People saw and criticized Parvati for forcing a frail old man to walk while she rode. Thus, they switched positions. They continued on, and more people started criticizing Shiva for forcing a young woman to work so hard while he stayed fat on the bull. Thus, both Parvati and Shiva rode together. Even further on, people criticized them for abusing the poor animal by both riding on it. So, they both got off and were then called idiots for bringing a bull to ride but then walking instead. The moral of the story is that no matter what you do, people are going to complain, so just do what you think is right. Japan has an interesting relationship between monks and warriors. For a large part of Japanese history, up until Nobunaga came in and reformed Japan, warrior monks in monasteries were a fairly common force. It was possible to recruit such monks to your war cause, and they were generally seen as skilled warriors. Ishun was born after this had dissolved and was no longer commonplace, but many warrior monks saw the honing of their weaponry as a form of meditation. This CE calls into question the contradiction of being a Buddhist monk, where one of the tenets is to never kill, and a warrior monk whose job it is to kill. The solution to this was found in the belief that killing out of self-defense and the defense of others was permissible, but should be avoided as much as possible, hence why it was generally frowned upon for a monk to be the instigator of a fight. The universe ring was one of Neza's weapons. It was similar to a chakram and meant to be thrown at enemies. Neza had complete control over its movements and could make them expand or contract at will. This, along with the flame wheels and fire tip spear, were gifts given to Neza upon his resurrection. According to FGO, the act of her giving one of these rings as a Bonsi is a sign that she trusts us to such an extent that she will attempt to resurrect herself to return to our side no matter what if she is to perish. This is very clearly meant to be reminiscent of the scene we witness in Babylon, the miracle provided by Merlin that caused flowers, a universal symbol of life, to bloom in the depths of Kerr. Ancient Mesopotamia, and a lot of other ancient civilizations for that matter, believed that the underworld was genuinely a place that one could just stumble into on accident. Life was incapable of existing there for long, and much like the flowers that bloomed in Kerr, they too eventually withered away. However, Fate's rendition of Eris shows that despite the blooming flowers vanishing, she will always remember that miracle. Divine metals are a common trope seen throughout many cultures and myths. What exactly distinguishes divine iron from normal iron is beyond me, outside of the name. But perhaps it is the process that transforms such a common thing as iron into the level of godhood. This is where dwarves come in in Norse mythology. Throughout Norse mythology, the dwarves are always seen as master craftsmen, being the creators of some of the gods' most powerful weapons, such as Thor's hammer, Mjolnir. Thus, it wouldn't be a stretch to assume that the weaponry of the Valkyrie were crafted through similar means, giving them their divine nature. Surprisingly, there is more to Ibaraki's CE than you may believe at first glance. Fireworks were originally introduced to Japan in the 17th century, and their meaning was festive in a different sort of way. Fireworks were used to mark tragic events, originally, as the bright colors and flashes could be equated to a life brightly burning and then fizzling out. As such, for Ibaraki, viewing fireworks in the context over Mount Oe could 100% be symbolic of a tragic event for her. All of her allies died on the mountain, including Shuten, with only herself and a few others surviving. I am absolutely reading way too much into this, but you know, whatever. Liang Yu's Bansi is not so much her spear itself, but rather an explanation as to why and what her spear is made of. Chinese ash trees are beautiful white flowering trees with incredibly durable and workable wood. As such, this makes it ideal for crafting a spear, which needs to be flexible enough to bend but strong enough to avoid being broken. Ash wood and ash trees themselves have been revered across several cultures for their strength and workability. Bradamantes is a ring that once belonged to Angelica of Cathay. It was integral in being used to rescue Ruggiero from his confinement by the sorceress Atalanta. The ring itself has the ability to remove all magic that's cast upon the wearer's eyes. Thus, if they were trapped blindly wandering a castle because of an enchantment, they could be freed. Also, the ring was originally stolen from Angelica, so that may be why Brad is actually pensive about returning it. Naturally, for Kage Tora, we are given a statue of the god Bishamatan, translated to roughly mean the eight-bladed Bishamatan. Bishamatan was a god of war and warriors with a particular note of being a vanquisher of those who cause evil. 
He is a guardian and gifter of various treasures and guards the places where the Buddha teaches. In terms of being a god of war, he actually appears much more reasonable than some, supposedly highlighting the beneficial aspects that come with fighting. Gareth's is a ring of transformation that allowed Gareth to hide his appearance. This likely comes from the fact that in several Gareth legends, Gareth himself hides his identity from others in order to prove his worthiness as a knight. One famous example is that Gareth was able to hold his own against Lancelot, but only on the condition that neither he nor Lancelot knew who the other was. The only other knight that is capable of doing this was Sir Tristan. Meltz holds no historiosity, but did you know that the sport of figure skating was invented by an Englishman sometime in the 18th century, though there are accounts of the Italians doing something similar before this time. It became what we know of it today by an American named Jackson Haynes, who added the energy and various movements that make it so beautiful. The Trident of Poseidon was a construction made by the Cyclops is for the god to use. Traditionally, a trident is a type of spear used for fishing, as the multiple prongs make it easier to pin down a fish. As such, it being the weapon of a god of the sea just makes logical sense. It's with this trident that Poseidon struck a rock near the Acropolis of Athens and created a sea, and supposedly it is his striking the earth with this trident that causes the earthquakes to happen. Romulus Chiarinus' Bon CE poses a bit of a problem for me because it is very abstract. The point of the CE is that the Roman Empire's influence is meant to elevate humanity to the gods, but given that their empire couldn't figure out that lead was bad for them and the fire is hot, I think there is more to it than that. If anything, this is likely an attempt of Romulus to reach out towards the area where he was initially from, given that he was the son of the gods after all. Thus, him reaching for the elevated land once more in the night sky seems to make a great deal of sense. Eris's Bonsai does all of the heavy lifting for me in terms of research. The plane modeled here is a miniature replica of the one flown by Antoine de saint exupéry which I have completely butchered, better known as the author of the story The Little Prince. Antoine himself based parts of the story after a real-life wreck that he was in in such a plane. Naturally, it should go without saying why the Little Prince holds a level of importance to Eris, given that Voyager's design is based very heavily off of the titular Little Prince. Yuz is nothing more than her getting her simple wish of spending the remainder of the summer with her beloved Zhang Yu. No jokes on this one, I'm just happy to see them together. Vritra is a demon who is able to create obstacles. This CE is meant to show that this power is not inherently evil. Let's look at what is presented to us in this Bon CE. This is most likely the Himalayan Mountains. It is a desolate, frozen obstacle that has obstructed both the flow of travel and commerce for centuries. However, it is also what provides a natural land barrier that makes invasion against India more difficult, and from the melting snow and ice, the Ganges River flows. So, much like the figure of Fritra himself, there is more than meets the eye when one encounters an obstacle. Throughout time immemorial, the aurora has been seen as a message from the heavens. Its meaning has been interpreted from being a blessing, or in other cultures, a sign of fire. It has always been seen as something ethereal and magical. Oh, and if you were curious as to whether or not it could be seen from England, it can be on rare occasions. In fact, it was spotted in the year of recording this, 2023, as far south as Cornwall. Percival's CE is the Lance Longinus, the very spear used by the Roman soldier of the same name to pierce the side of Jesus during his crucifixion. This spear is currently believed to still exist and is kept safe in the Vatican. It is believed that the wielder of Longinus will be granted incredible power, but should they lose the spear, they will die. In fact, and I shit you not this is real, during World War II there was an actual race between the Germans and the Americans to locate various lost sacred relics that could supposedly give their owners power. Longinus was one such item that was supposedly searched for. If this sounds too close to the plot of Indiana Jones, that is because this is what Indiana Jones was inspired by. This is yet another example of FGO lore overriding history. I genuinely have nothing for you for the CE. All of the information present has to do with the coming Guda Guda event that likely will somewhat revolve around the fact that Ryoma and Oria will finally be able to make a pact that allows their souls to be ever intertwined. Going from that relatively happy CE to this one that is significantly more depressing, Mary Annings is equally weird and obtuse. This one is just simply titled Birthplace, which puts its location in Lyme Regis, Dorset, England. The Bonsi itself describes that she is dying by being forgotten piece by piece and claims that no one needed her. In reality, this is likely because her contributions to the archaeological field of research were often given to others, making her appear less relevant in history than she actually was. If you want an example of something that she posited and partially was able to prove, she was one of the minds behind figuring out that extinction often happens in massive events rather than an animal just simply dying out. What else could good old Don C.E. be other than his beautiful princess Dulciana? Naturally, the princess was instead a farm girl that he was delusional about, but that didn't stop her existence from being the thing that spurred him into action and set him out on all of his adventures. Other than a pair of giants, I cannot think of a better thing that encapsulates the essence of Don Quixote. A shout out to the Behind the Servants Britta Mart script that I've had written for three months and have done nothing with. Minor spoilers for the character of Britta Martin Fate. 
Our Britomart is not the real Britomart, but one of the children of the real one. I do not recall a scarlet dress being something relevant to the Britomart from Legends, but this may instead be a reference to a different hero of the poem, the Fairy Queen, called the Red Cross Knight. The Fairy Queen has a focus on its heroes showing a certain virtue, with Britomart herself being chastity. The virtue of the Red Cross was a representation of holiness, which, if you lived in medieval Europe, was absolutely a source of power. Starting off strong with a moonlit knight, this is most likely a reference to Stay Knight, where this man, who remember is not the real Kojiro, has finally finally come to an end of his training and journey, happily dying to a superior swordsman. The arm of the demon Shaitan, grafted to the body of a desperate man. Shaitan is of course actually the demon Satan, which is very likely being differentiated from the fallen angel Lucifer in this context. Being able to control the arm of such a great demon likely means that a pact of some variety would have been in order, though it is described that Cursed Arm tricked the demon and took the arm for himself. In this case, Satan still has control of the arm, but figured out what Hassan would do with it and thus allowed it to be used for the time being, knowing full well that he would be able to get back at him in time. Much like Uriel, Stenos has no basis in reality and is purely a fate invention. The propriety of the Nine Dukes is the chamber that served as Qin Shi Huang's place for receiving others, and is where Jin Kei attempted his assassination of the Emperor. The CE does bring up the important historical note that Jin Kei was just barely out of distance to make the kill. This Bon CE itself reflects on how the invention of the guillotine has made it so that anyone can be an executioner. The occupation of an executioner was an art, truly. It was a job that if you were not precise in your action, the executed would unnecessarily suffer a great deal. A good example of this is that you need to calculate rope lengths when hanging people, otherwise there are drastic consequences. We know damn little about Samson the Younger, but most executioners did care about whether the accused would suffer or not, though not so much out of emotional value, but rather because they could lose their jobs if done improperly. Most film renditions or parodies give the mask the same plain white look with his disfigured face beneath it. FGO instead made the mask in the image of how his face is described with a skull-like appearance and sunken eyes, but beneath it is a beautiful man. It's all a not-so-subtle reflection of what's inside that counts. Still, I'm not going to be leveling his skills though. Matahari was famously a spy and posed as an exotic dancer. Matahari herself is a very complex figure, and her addition to fate is somewhat odd, though I do love her regardless. Much of what Matahari did was for money, supposedly. Many of her motives are unknown because of her nature as a spy, but on several different occasions she would accept large sums of money to perform for German royalty during the First World War, in hopes that she would be able to acquire secrets. Given how she is described in FGO, her riders here are likely equating her need for money to assist her lover, who was fighting in the war at one point and had lost an eye. The Iron Maiden is not, and never was, an actual implement of torture, though there are ones that are similar to it. It was a misidentification of a type of device called a Shandemount, which confines a person's limbs to a tight area while the head is exposed. The addition of spikes was made from a description of martyrs tortured in a 5th century document, but the device described was not an Iron Maiden. There is a gap in historical evidence of this type of device ever being used, and believe me when I say medieval artists loved their torture art. Jack's London on a Misty Night is maybe one of the most self-explanatory CEs. It's the prime time to commit atrocities when visibility is at its lowest and against people who won't be missed. Jekylls is a nice nod to how he is in reality. On the outside, he is the model of a perfect gentleman. Calm, composed, respectable, kind, and fair. However, this is only his outward appearance. The true Henry Jekyll was a man of several vices, and when alone, he would greedily indulge himself in these. In order to separate this part of himself, he concocted a potion that would seal his vices away, but as time went on, these vices manifested into Mr. Hyde and would slowly take him over against his will. This is the ever-growing hit list of sabers that X has. Shout out to getting not just one, but two for the anniversary. X, being a gag character, naturally has a gag bon CE describing her mission of eliminating the ever-increasing number of saber faces, or sabers in general. I will say it is nice to see that she does get along with some of them. Brief K and K spoilers, kind of. The reason Shiki wears a red jacket is because she was posed the question by a certain someone if she could wear anything over her kimono, to which she responded by buying the red jacket. That person, for years to come, would always compliment how it suited her well. Carrie's Bon CE is a brief explanation to his secondary noble phantasm, his knife, which he describes as his origin. This has a few potential meanings, but is explicitly said to not be the metaphorical naming convention of origin, but rather where he originates from. It may be more descriptive as his origins as a mage killer, and the fact that he would use a knife for all but the most extreme scenarios. Hundred Face is entirely a fake creation, but part of the idea behind this CE is that the cult of the Hassans had a wealth of knowledge supposedly able to rival some of the great libraries in the world, and the Hundred Face poured over all of these in order to be a master of as many things as possible. Shu Ten's wine is ironically what killed her. This was enchanted wine, given to her by Raiko that temporarily immobilized the powerful Oni, giving Raiko the opportunity to decapitate her. 
This is why her Noble Phantasm applies a disgusting amount of debuffs, though it doesn't explain why when Shuten drinks it now, she's fine. Doing any meaningful research on Ninja is a fool's errand. According to folklore, Fumakotaro was a half-oni, exhibiting strength akin to the legendary monsters. This is likely because his name, Fuma, can be translated to Wind Demon or Evil Wind. The idea behind this CE is that when one acts as an oni, one may just become one. Committing acts of evil while disguised on the outside still allows them to seep into the inside. This one always hits hard because of the naming paired with it. Proof of existence. Relics left behind as evidence that she was once here. Is perhaps one of the most human wishes that one can have. Given her role as a living weapon, unable to interact with anything without killing it, she is unable to leave behind much, save for her mask, her weapons, and some beautiful flowers. Our first summer CE is from Shisho, displaying what it means to have etiquette. As one may imagine, even when she is relaxing, Skahawk is strict about appearances and actions. As such, she has modeled her abode as she believes a summer vacation stay should be. A sunset, beautiful flowers to be adorned in her hair, a dashing swimsuit, and of course, eleven knives. Truly a woman's best friend. The asp that killed Cleopatra, or rather the one that she used to commit suicide. There's a lot of factors that led to why she killed herself, but the long and short of it is that one section of Rome really didn't like her, led by a man named Octavian, who then ransacked Egypt and attempted to capture her. While she was initially caught, she learned that she was going to be transported to Rome and paraded around, and rather than live with that shame, had an asp bite her, leading her to die. That is a super brief explanation, and as I said, there are a ton of factors, so just bear with me on that one. This is one of the coolest CEs ever. Lore-wise for fate, Gramps has merged with the Angel of Death, Azrael, allowing him to quote-unquote live forever. He exists on the cusp of life, neither being alive nor dead. He now acts as a divine force of nature, delivering death to those who deserve it. The 108 stars of destiny are the 108 heroes of the Chinese epic The Water Margin. Yan King is ranked as the 36th of the heavenly stars under the skillful star of destiny. The number 108 has significance in many parts of Asia because of the spread of Buddhism, but was also prevalent in Hinduism before this. In the latter part of her life, Wu was sickly. She had been a fairly successful ruler until this point, and brought a pair of brothers into her fold who acted similar to advisors to her. This created fears in the Imperial Palace, and a coup was staged in which these brothers were executed and Wu was deposed, making a man named Li Zhan regent. This palace in her Bansi'i, the Shangyang Palace, was essentially a place for her to remain as a figurehead as opposed to the true ruler she had worked so hard to be. This is a gift from Ozymandias to Nidocris, a miniature scale of her scarab, but with a Ramsium pyramid atop of it. The significance of this is that scarabs were believed to mirror the sun god who rolled the sun across the sky. As such, Ozymandias, a vessel for the sun, would naturally have a strong connection to scarabs. Geos is similar to Serenities for one reason. It's another proof of oneself. The difference being that Chio, despite hating the curse put upon her, decides that she will live with it as opposed to fighting against it. What is pictured is a medicine box with a family clan symbol of the Koga on it, or at the very least one of them because I found a bunch of different Koga clan symbols. Danzo's ox comes from an anecdote that in order to prove his abilities, he swallowed his ox whole in front of a large crowd. I kind of love this CE's description because it's Donzo denying ever having swallowed the ox and that it's something that she'd never do. It's also a nice little characterization detail that she likes oxen because of how carefree they are. Oh, also the little Fuma charm hangs from the horns which she describes as her favorite. I love Donzo. Origami for the sake of play, as seen in Osakabe Hime CE, started around the Sengoku period or the 15th century. Much like everything artsy, the upper class is the one who experimented with paper folding the most and cranes were a popular motif. Hime, being a princess, sort of, would have had ample time to learn the fine arts of paper folding. The popular description of Semiramis as a poisoner comes from Voltaire's play, in which she poisons her husband. The point of this CE is that trust is something that is built up over time, but it's up to you as the person whether trust gained over time is worth anything at all, as even a minor infraction can have permanent repercussions on such a thing. In other words, she's testing you now that your bonds are so high. I'd say drink the wine and watch your reaction as you go for it. Ezos is a reflection on his life as he gazes at the sky on the day that he is to be executed. I have a full video on Ezo and what led to this, but long story short, he gained a fair amount of fame as a killer and bodyguard, but was considered too much of a loose cannon, so everyone around him more or less abandoned him, at which point he would be arrested and executed. This CE reflects on where in his life it was that everything seemed to change for him, and why. The fan of the Tengu as well as other Tengu accoutrements. The outfit of a Tengu is meant to resemble that of a monk, because Tengu are often believed to be transformed wicked monks. The red face mask is meant to represent a Daitengu, a creature of great power that resembles a man more than a bird. 
Finally, the Tengu's fan is a weapon able to summon enormous winds. In Folk Legends of Ushiwakamaru, he was taught how to fight using a war fan by a Tengu using one of these fans. So while Consort Yu's only has a minor historical connection, that being the poppy flowers being associated with Consort Yu, this CE is still fairly impactful. The book is one that she doesn't really care for, but rather uses a way to get people to leave her alone. Yu doesn't particularly care for humans to begin with, and certainly never had any interest in communicating with them, so she used the book as a way to avoid them. So for her to give up that layer of protection willingly shows that, if only slightly, she has grown as a creature to accept those around her. No longer needing to hide away is an amazing thing. Old but strong is the only way to describe Old Man Lee. He spent his entire life honing his craft of fighting and then teaching others to fight as well. I'll do a behind the servants on him eventually, but every resource I find is Google translated from Chinese and Kama's Bonsi is her sugarcane bow and floral arrows. The arrows have five distinct flowers upon them belonging to a lotus, jasmine, mango, ashoka, and blue lotus, though in FGO they opt mostly for the standard lotus. These act in a way similar to the arrows of Cupid, causing one struck to fall in love. This, of course, is what inevitably led to Kama being descent evaporated by Shiva. I really like Grey's Bonsi because it harkens back to Arthurian myth. Sir Kay, the adoptive older brother of King Arthur, was a crude belligerent bastard. Essentially, he was one of Arthur's first knights and one of his most loyal followers until they eventually had a falling out. He was the kind of person who spoke his mind regardless of the repercussions, but because of these actions spurred others into greater things. So seeing him appear the same and treat his adoptive little sister the same way he always has is very cute. Corday is such an unusual character in history. Genuinely, if ever there was a case for time travel existing, I could see her being a martyr for a different future. Regardless, this is Corday recounting why she killed Jean-Paul Marat. Simply, and even historically, it was because she didn't like him. She found him to be a tyrant and a monster and thus wished him dead. She had no political motivations and no backing of others, simply one woman who wished to be rid of one man. The sweet thing is that the Bonsi says that though she feels inferior as a member of the Throne of Heroes, she is glad that it allowed us to both meet. Okay, this one is adorable. First and foremost, how'd you get that off of you? Second, this is Okita's speech to the Master in hopes of us inheriting her jet-style martial arts. She reflects on the summer that we shared together and wishes for us to continue bonding, only for us to shoot her down because we refused to put that jet pack on. Hogan's is another one with little historiosity, but rather her bond with us as a master and student. Her Takageda, tossed leisurely to the ground as if kicked off in a hurry, come to see us. It is important to remember that Hogan was very reluctant about taking new students, especially humans, so this CE is meant to show her true nature, a playful girl that wants to spend time with those that she cares for. In fact, the writing of the CE's description almost paints it to be something romantic, so maybe all that bride talk from before is coming to fruition. I shit you not, this CE is essentially Kongyan explaining the the reason she started NFF services was out of her massive respect for Hugh Hefner, God rest his soul. This is also why she takes the guise of a bunny, a play on the Playboy Bunny. Do with that information what you will. Alright lads, all three Summer Valks have different bonds to ease, likely to reflect their different personalities, starting with Thrud. We have a pistol, described as her trump card, made from her divine shield when she manifested in her summer form. Real Valkyries carried no such weapon, and this one was located in a Scandinavian forest. Hildur gets a Sam 66 submachine gun made out of divine iron and meant to represent the Spear of Odin Gungnir. We are given further explanations as to why the Valkyries have been given guns, this being broken into two theories. One is that they played too many FPS games with Tomoe, and two is that Odin thinks that guns are cool. This is not a traditional weapon of the Valkyries and was found leading near a fjord. Ortlin shares with us her rations, namely a ration of mead. It is adorable that she really likes mead and solidifies for me that she is the best of the Valks. Historically, mead was considered one of the drinks of the gods and a liquor without comparison. In fact, it was one of the drinks served in Valhalla, so it actually has a direct correlation with the Valks, which is nice. Also, my second favorite alcoholic drink. This CE was taken directly from Chapter 71 of the Water Margin, where the gathering of the 108 heroes was held, and the Talus Priest asked for a sign from the heavens. What sounds like a UFO appears flaming from the sky and crashes into the ground, vanishing. And when the spot is dug, three feet down are stone tablets with the names of the 108 stars given. Hu Yanzhou was listed number 8 among the heavens, and given the nickname the Twin Rods of the Prestige Star. Tez's is pretty interesting because it calls back on a few things. First and foremost, he seems to be making an argument that while serpents are seen as special for their healing properties, the mightiest creature in the forest is the jaguar, which was a belief held by the Aztecs. Tez also comments that while the jaguar is the most feared, it itself is not a god, but he is. The jaguar is his nagual, which is something like a spirit animal. So, when he dons the visage of the mightiest creature in the jungle, he becomes akin to the mightiest god in the heavens. It is believed that for this reason as well, many Aztec warriors donned the helmets and masks of jaguars in hopes of gaining their strength in battle. The Food of the Gods 
mushrooms. The historical Lacusto is believed to be the one who killed Nero's adoptive father, Claudius, and was a notorious poisoner under the employ of several high-ranking Roman officials. Lacusta herself served under Nero and profited greatly, even if Nero did beat the hell out of her for not using fast-acting poisons that one time. She would go on to teach others her ways before being executed after Nero's death. As to why it's called the Food of the Gods, it's because, according to the CE, Nero's father became a god after eating them, which is super morbid. Kashin Koji is reminded of the thing that inspired his first killing. Or at least, that's what is described. From what I could find, this connection is tenuous at best, and while Koji is described as a powerful magician, nothing of this sort seems to come up. However, when a character is almost all myths, writers are given creative liberty to add things as they see fit. The shapeless island of Medusa's myth is not a real place that we know of, but likely one of many spotted islands across the Mediterranean Sea. The island itself was, for a time, said to be littered with the statues of Medusa's victims, be they unwary sailors who had stopped or former heroes who had failed in their quest. In a contender for my favorite flavor of Bonsai, we have George's photo collection. It should go without saying that St. George never took any pictures because he was too busy fighting for Jesus. So in Caldea, he grew fond of the act of capturing little moments in time. This CE is aptly titled, What Can can be left behind as a somewhat romantic idea that George wishes for us to remember all of the times that we spent together. Blackbeard's is much more in-depth than you may think, much like the character of Blackbeard himself. What is seen here is a model replica of his flagship, the Queen Anne's Revenge. Blackbeard had gained a serious level of notoriety near the end of his life thanks to his blockade of Charleston, but he also didn't want to be hunted for his entire life, so he decided to do something blasphemous and run aground his beloved flagship. With this action, he sought a pardon, got one, but eventually he met another pirate he knew named Charles Vane, and the pair partied on the beaches long enough for people to get suspicious of them. Blackbeard would eventually return to his old ways, which is what the CE is meant to symbolize. Despite trying to take the man from the sea, you can never take the sea from the man. Boudicca's CE is a representation of rebellion against tyranny. After the Romans desecrated her and her husband's land, Boudicca led a number of successful assaults against the Roman settlements. This all culminated into one bad strategic decision on her part that would eventually allow the Romans to kill her and her troops. While Boudicca never got the victory she so deserved and craved, she is remembered today as a beacon against oppression throughout Great Britain. Usumidori, the name given to the sword of Ushiwaka by Ushiwaka himself, Usumidori means light green, and Ushi called it as such that it could cleave mountains while being as beautiful as a springtime mountain. Alexander's Bonsi is the encounter he had with a certain philosopher named Diogenes. Diogenes was renowned for his quick wit and intellect and a practitioner of cynicism. He lived in a cask with a singular possession of a bowl which he eventually threw away after seeing a child drink with his hands. Alexander wanted to visit such a fascinating figure and offered to give him anything that he desired. In response, Diogenes asked Alexander to move away so that he could see the sun. This complete disregard for authority and wealth stayed with Alexander, and supposedly he is claimed to have said, If I were not Alexander, I wish to be Diogenes. So there is a lot of discussion about Marie Antoinette's necklace, and I'm really not going to add to it because I don't know enough about it. During the waning period of the French monarchy, a plot was manufactured to deface Marie. Marie was offered a necklace of fine diamonds to purchase, but she declined. This led to a trickster called Jean de Valou Saint Remy to forge her signature on documentations that acted as receipts, and then further claimed that the queen had refused to pay the crown jeweler for such a fine piece. The anti-monarchy sentiment was already high, so no level of truth was investigated and the necklace became a key player in the eventual revolution against the monarchy. According to legend, on the return trip to see if her brother Lazarus had been resurrected, Jesus gave Martha a simple walking stick to travel with. That is all there is to the CE. The reason it manifests as a holy staff is that when she manifests as a servant, the big J man allowed it to be imbued with holy power to assist her. It is possible that this stick was found in the collegiate church of Tarascon, which held a number of other relics that once belonged to Martha. From my research, there is no proof that a golden wheel was added to the ship of the Golden Hind, but perhaps there is more to this than just that. Let's start with the fact that this is completely historically inaccurate because the original Golden Hind would not have had a wheel at all, but instead something called a whip staff. Wheels would become more popular in the 18th century, but note that this CE is called the Golden Rudder, not the Golden Wheel. This is also 100% a fabrication, so the real lore of the CE is that you were robbed of information much as a pirate was wont to do. Calico Jack was a famous pirate and the captain of the ship that had Anne and Mary on it. Calico Jack was ambushed in Jamaica after his crew had become so intoxicated that they could not move. The only two capable of fighting were Anne and Mary, who held the line as best as they could and fought with a savageness akin to a cornered animal. They would be arrested along with the intoxicated crew and captain. And Bonnie famously said to Calico Jack before his death that, quote, if you had fought like a man, you wouldn't have to hang like a dog. Anne and Mary both claimed to be pregnant to stave off their executions for piracy. Mary would die in prison of illness, and Anne just kind of vanishes from history. It is stated that she was not executed though, so her fate remains unknown. 
Lamray was the name of King Arthur's favorite horse, therefore Lamray II is naturally the favored ride of a new King Arthur. This is supposed to be Santa's sleigh, which first entered the popular zeitgeist in 1821 thanks to a poem which depicted Santa Claus riding a sleigh pulled by a singular reindeer. The hippogriff is actually not a Stolfo's mount at all, but rather the mount of his fellow paladin, Bradamante. It is the child of a mare and a griffin and is strong enough to fly to the moon. It came into the possession of Bradamante after she defeated the sorcerer Adelante. The reason why it manifests with Astolfo is because Astolfo would often borrow the horse to search for things throughout his various quests. This spring is probably actually where Maeve died. She had moved to live on an island called Inclarnan, and would bathe every morning in a spring there. The son of a woman Maeve had killed sought revenge against her and practiced hitting an apple off of a stake placed directly at the height of Maeve's head. Once he was confident, he took a piece of cheese and flung it at Maeve's head, killing her instantly. As to why there is a Triskelly symbol there, it is because it is Irish. Believe me when I say that there is no agreed upon meaning for that symbol aside from it being Celtic in origin. Iskander CE tells of the famed anecdotal tale of the Gordian Knot. The Gordian Knot itself once belonged on an ox cart of a peasant turned king of Frigia. It was so incredibly intricate that one could not make out from where the rope started and where it ended. At the time of Iskander's arrival, Phrygia was a province of the Persian Empire, and an oracle foretold that anyone who could unravel the knot would become the king of all of Asia. Iskander spent a fair amount of time examining the knot, trying to make heads or tails of how to go about unraveling it, when he suddenly took his sword out and cut it in half. Thus, the prophecy was fulfilled and Iskander would go to conquer most of the known world. The tale itself is meant to say that sometimes the most complex of problems are solved with the most simple, outside-of-the-box solutions. As you can imagine, Kintoki never rode a motorcycle, mostly because there is no petrol stations up in the mountains. However, there is a relatively famous art piece- However, there is a relatively famous art piece produced by the Hokusai School of Art of Kintoki riding a bear, albeit a non-golden one. As for his association with lightning, which is important to this particular scene, it is because his mountain witch mother was impregnated by a lightning strike produced by a dragon god. Or at least that is one telling of the story. The Ramseum is the name of the burial chamber of Ramses II, aka Ozymandias. This building took 20 years to construct and it was dubbed the Temple of a Million Years. Unfortunately, the location in which it was situated, along with its treatment by the early Europeans in the medieval ages, have left the temple nothing more than a ruin. Pridwin was the boat of King Arthur used by him to sail during his waterbound expeditions. Some of these included the search for a monstrous dog named Rimia, it is used to pursue the great board towards Trith, and supposedly is able to sail between the world of the living and the world of the dead. The ability of Pridwin to transform is not a fate invention either. It was supposedly able to become a shield as well that bore the image of the Virgin Mary, so its transformation into a surfboard can be somewhat rationalized. Also, you will notice the Virgin Mary is also visible on the board. As to why Mordred has it, it's because she stole it. On first glance, you may be led to believe that Ketz's Bonsi is the Aztec calendar. Rather, it is an explanation of what the calendar is meant to mark. In the Aztec myth, the gods often attack each other and in these fights have destroyed the sun, which in turn destroyed the world. However, they always remake the sun in the world and the winner of the fight becomes the god of that sun. At present, there have been four previous suns that have been destroyed and we are currently on the fifth with it being formed by the god Nanahuitzan. Columbus's Bonsi is his favorite ship, La Nina. In actuality, this ship is called Santa Clara, as the tradition of the time was to name your ships after saints. However, the crew affectionately referred to her as La Nina as a joke on her owner's name, Juan Nino. La Nina was one of the three ships that Columbus led on his first expedition, and would be proven later on to be a relatively lucky ship, being the sole survivor of 17 ships during a hurricane in 1495. Obviously this is a parody, but according to its description, this mop is quite possibly the most powerful physical weapon in Chaldea. Described as having a handle harder than Arendite and a tip hotter than Galatine, this mop could theoretically give even the fatal Gay Bolg a run for its money in terms of lethality. Nothing of historical merit is to be found here, just the, just the trophy that was destined for the winner of the Ishtar Cup that was never given away. This is because, after Ishtar was revealed to have been trying to use the whole thing as a summoning ritual for Gugulana, she was embarrassed after she failed and couldn't bring herself to cough it up. The Library of Ivan the Terrible is perhaps one of the greatest sources of knowledge of the medieval world, boasting volumes of works once belonging to Constantinople and the Library of Alexandria. It was a source of international knowledge, including ancient texts of black magic that supposedly Ivan was eager to try and learn. However, the library itself has since been lost. At present, it is believed to be under the Kremlin, but extensive searches have yielded no results, so this treasure trove of ancient wisdom has been lost to the ages for now. The Shield of Achilles was specially commissioned by his mother to none other than the god of the forge Hephaestus. Achilles decided to return to battle after Patroclus was killed by Hector and robbed of the armor Achilles had lent him. 
This shield in particular is noted as having an extremely ornate and detailed mural pattern showing scenes in the various rings in the shield. These included the earth in the heavens on the outermost ring, two cities full of people, a field being plowed, a field being harvested, children pulling grapes from a vine, a herdsman defending his cattle, a sheep farmer, a great ball full of dancers, and the innermost contained depictions of a wild ocean. The English name of the CE is slightly off because it should instead be called the object that can hold the earth, as that is what the shield quite literally depicts, the various aspects of the earth. Ryoma's is the anecdote about his first meeting with Oreo. Supposedly, after climbing to the top of a mountain, he discovered a divine spear plunged into the head of a great dragon. He removed the spear from the dragon's head and did so without considering the repercussions of his actions and with little care for his own safety. This is meant to be anecdotal about how he was viewed in life, someone who was willing to pull the carpet out from under everyone because he believed it was the right thing to do, with little regard to his own life or well-being. This one is simply a meme that came to life. Red Hair's favorite food is carrots according to fate, and as such receiving not just any carrots, but what is quite possibly the flying general of carrots from Red Hair shows a dedication to the master stronger than steel. Tea Time with Raina While I would be mindful of accidental mercury poisoning, did you know that the concept of British tea time is relatively recent in terms of world history? It was created by Duchess Anna of Bedford in 1840, who would get hungry around 4 o'clock in the afternoon every single day because the dinner time was set at a late 8 p.m. To sate her hunger, she would request a pot of tea with a tray of bread and butter and eventually add sandwiches to it. The concept grew popular among her friends and eventually spread throughout the whole of the British Isles. I'm going to go out on a bit of a theory crafting limb for this one and say that we don't have all of the pieces to Da Vinci's puzzle quite yet. There are two ways in which I think we can interpret this CE. First, this is a new Da Vinci experiencing a new world where her adult self was often trapped inside, so going on this beautiful journey is simply her experiencing life to the fullest. Alternatively, this is a very early implemented CE that will come back into play later in the story when Da Vinci is killed off again, making the same remark as the final lines, everything is so beautiful, just like a painting. Something that a lot of people are unaware of is that piracy back in the day was not something so simple as a bunch of criminals yar harring on a boat until they found people to attack. Pirates were essentially stuck on a floating house, which meant that maintenance and work on it had to be done. It also meant that you were stuck in the same area as your compatriots for extended periods of time. To prevent the whole thing going up in smoke and people killing each other, a captain had to maintain order. Bart was one of the first to revolutionize what we know as the Pirate Code. Funny enough, it was a different Bart who was credited for this invention. These were a set of laws that applied to every man on the ship, the captain included, and were laid bluntly to every member of the crew so that there was no confusion. The creation of Bart's Pirate's Code spread to other ships and captains as time went on, who had the unspoken or looser rules, but now they could all point to something that they could collectively agree upon. So Carmilla's is funny. The Iron Maiden Vehicular Homicide Edition actually has a name. Carmilla calls it Lola, named after, in her words, a woman who entertained her in the past. In the tale of Carmilla, the main character is named Laura, but when you convert that into Japanese, it becomes Rora, which, when converted back into English, sounds identical to Lola. So a nice little mistranslation in this one, but a cute reference nonetheless. In The Legend of Mandricardo, he took an oath that he would not wield another sword until he gained possession of Durandal. Because of this oath, he was given the gift that any weapon that he did wield could match the strength and might of Durandal. For this reason, he can make his weapons more powerful, but they don't actually change into his sword of choice. Thus, the energy that is exerted can shatter whatever he uses to substitute for a sword, in the case of FGO, a wooden sword. The white bull that Europa rides is none other than the chief of the Greek gods, Zeus. One day, Zeus decided that he wanted to shag Europa, so he turned into a white bull and mixed into her father's herd of cows. As Europa was tending to the herd, she saw the mysterious white bull and climbed on its back, as you do. It then ran off with her across the sea, all the way to the island of Crete where it turned back into Zeus and took advantage of her. She was then made the first queen of Crete and gifted jewelry by the gods and three automatons to guard her on her island. One of these is her noble phantasm, Talos. So pleased was Zeus with the whole affair that he took the white bull's form and added it into the stars in the form of the constellation Taurus. So for some reason I never put it together, but the armor that Odysseus wears is actually the legendary shield of Athena, Aegis, or Aegis. I call it the Aegis because I also say gif and not jif, so forgive me. The Aegis is the impenetrable shield belonging to Athena that according to some sources has the head of the Gorgon as its embossment and a golden snake scaled exterior. The Aegis was capable of shrouding Mount Ida in clouds and creating thunder so vicious that it terrified men. There's even a sort of precedent for it being armor, as the Aegis in some myths is described as the breastplate of Zeus, despite Zeus very rarely wearing it. As to why Odysseus has it when it was never mentioned in any of his legends, supposedly Athena, who is shy in the FGO-verse, gave it to Odysseus and then struck it from all records. 
Murasaki seems to have fallen down the sci-fi rabbit hole, which is good and all, but doesn't really make for a decent explanation. So, I did some bonus legwork for all of you, and attempted to identify the two novels that can be seen on the cover of the CE. The one on the right, I believe, is most definitely Natsu no Tobira, aka The Door to Summer, which I talked about in the last video for Little Joan Alter. Most of the results feature a similar cat, and the alteration between it being in a window rather than a door seems like a good way to skirt copyright. The second was more difficult because it's just a leg, a backpack, and a street with a bus. This one is a bit more of a stretch, but it could be Temple Alley Summer, though that is more of a horror than a sci-fi, but close enough. As for the one with the purple cover and some kanji, it's too hidden to tell, so if you think you know, please let me know down in the comments. We return to my favorite kind of Bonsai -E with Nemo's group photograph with his Marines. This photo was taken immediately following the imaginary scramble incident as a commemoration of Nemo accepting you as a new master. CEs like this add a lot of depth to the character, and for that I appreciate them greatly. It's nice to see the little snippets of how our bond has actually had an impact on the servants, and makes the bonding process feel much more worth it. I'll take pain and suffering for 500, please. This is the wedding dress that Hapatrot has made for her dream bride. After millennia of waiting and preparing, she finally has found that person she has always dreamed would wear her dress. That person is our dear sweet Kohai, Mash. As to whether this holds any folkloric connections, it does in a way, but indirectly. Hapatrot was a master spinner, but was disfigured for it, and as such served as a cautionary tale to husbands to not force their wives to do nothing but spin all day. If they ever make a life-size Habitrop plush that's to scale, I'm going to buy it so please make that. My first thought for this CE is that the featured creature is the Leviathan, but they would actually call it that if that were the case. Instead, it is a sub-mechanical serpent reminiscent of how FGO portrays the Greek gods. So, this is either an aspect of Poseidon or something else entirely. The CE claims that it is the originator of the Loch Ness Monster, and Canis claims to have fought it in the Mediterranean. I double-checked and she has no dialogue directly mentioning the Leviathan, but a lot about drinking with people, so your guess is as good as mine. Liz dons a hoop dress and glass slippers in order to cosplay as Cinderella. The glass slippers of old fairy tales would only fit upon the foot of their owner as they were enchanted. Keeping with Liz's bloody nature in the tale of Cinderella, her stepsisters would actually cut and deform their own feet in order to force themselves into the slippers. But this was eventually found out and so the crows pecked out their eyes as punishment, which in terms of fairy tale punishments is getting off kinda easy. Tai Gong Wong gives us an explanation of his weapon of elegance, a divine iron rod with a mystical attachment that moves like thread but is as tough as a blade. This device is able to kill immortal beings by smashing them across the head. It also works on non mortals in the same fashion. This exact device is not mentioned in the Investiture of the Gods, but rather is modeled after Tai's fishing rod with no hook. Debrynya's bond CE is supposed to be the dragon Zeme Gornich. This is the three-headed dragon that Debrynya felled with the use of a Greek hat. The tale itself is that Debrynya completely disobeyed his mother and as such encountered the dragon. Initially, they came to a non-aggression pact so long as they left each other alone, but then the dragon stole a princess and Debrynya had to get her back or be killed. The bond CE though plays around with the fact that this is not Debrynya and that the more popular story is about Debrynya leaving his wife. In other words, this is just teasing her. Side note, can we get a scene for an event where all of these dragon mounts communicate with each other? Like Terrace can demand an onsen or something? Cool, thanks. Constantine's is his memories of his final stand in the fall of Constantinople. It muses on how so often in history we hear about losing battles but having a comeback and winning the war, but for this time no such story is told. Rather, this is one about people losing everything and how it was all meaningless in the end leaving the losers with nothing but rage. Bakin's is his magnum opus, the Nanso Satomi Hakendan, a tale of warriors coming together to fight for the Satomi clan. The work took 28 years to complete and is still performed today in Kabuki Theater. The novel consists of over 100 booklets and is the largest piece of and is the single largest piece of Japanese literature. At the time of its completion, Bakin had gone completely blind and had to rely on his daughter to write as he told her the tale. Finally, I have absolutely nothing for this one, kind of leaving it off on a bit of a bad note. I searched through the entirety of the Investiture of the Gods and couldn't find any reference to a bird like this. From what I can find, there is no bird that attacked Daji and scarred her face. The only thing that comes close is a winged celestial who descends upon Tai's forces. What is interesting, however, is that apparently this bird makes friends with Kama's parrot and Semiramis' doves and they discuss war crimes together. That's not a joke, look it up. Medea has the staff of the goddess Hecate. Hecate was a goddess of several things, such as herbs, medicine, the moon, and snakes. In fact, she became the goddess of witches after the fact, primarily due to her nocturnal behavior and the various things associated with her. Her connection to Medea is twofold, in that she taught Medea in the ways of medicine and magic, hence why Medea is portrayed as a witch. The other is that in later accounts, Medea is actually the child of Hecate, though this is generally dismissed as an alteration. Jill's Bonsi is a letter from what the community at large has decided is Prelati. 
Jills was fascinated yet terrified of the occult. He had witnessed firsthand what can only be described as miracles performed by Joan of Arc, so he had no doubts to the question of whether God was real or not. However, by extension, if God was real, then the devil and his demons were real as well. God only answers the phone for a select few, but demons were much less fickle. As such, Jills would hire magicians to see if they could summon demons or demonstrate real magic in front of him. While most failed, Francois Prelati supposedly was able to conjure a demon in front of Giles eventually. As such, Prelati was brought into the fold of Giles' child murdering ways. Prelati himself, in reality, was more likely a huckster latching onto Giles as a way to make money, with little evidence to suggest any of his magical claims were real. That said, it makes his place in modern myth all the more interesting. Hans's letter to his darling is a very curious addition to the game. Hans was very famously bisexual in his romantic life, which drew the ire of much of Denmark. This particular letter, though, may be meant to represent a correspondence between him and a woman named Riborg Voigt, who was a childhood sweetheart of Anderson and one of his first loves. The letter itself was found still in his possession on a chest after he died, years after it had been written. Other possible correspondence for the letter could be between him and Charles Dickinson, the latter of whom began ignoring Anderson after he realized Anderson was attracted to him. I enjoy Shakespeare's Bon C.E., which is simply a typewriter, immensely. It perfectly encapsulates Fate's depiction of him being an overzealous author. The first commercial typewriters were made in 1874 and grew in public popularity in the 1880s. It was a revolutionary invention that made the process of writing quick, efficient, and 100% legible. As such, giving a device like this to someone like Shakespeare is a brilliant thought because the speed at which he could produce new works would be greatly enhanced. Also, I believe this is a nice little reference to Apocrypha. The parasitic bombs of Mephistopheles are meant to be a metaphor made real. A contract with a demon is very similar to a parasitic bomb in a lot of ways. It has a time limit that will eventually kill you, as was the tale of Faust. Though in Faust, parasitism is not quite accurate, as Faust did benefit from Mephisto's contract, but it would ultimately lead to Faust's demise. Or not, depending on which version you read. The Haydn Quartets were written for fellow composer Joseph Haydn. Rather than explain to you what they are, here's a sample of all six. Normally, there is a catalyst required to perform a heroic spirit summoning. Usually, you need something directly related to the servant or some physical artifact from their past that can be channeled to draw them from the throne of heroes. This tattered piece of crimson mantle was used by Waver Velvet as one such catalyst. The tree Yggdrasil is the world tree of Norse mythology. Entangled around its massive branches are the nine worlds, and down below its roots, evil creatures attempt to destroy it. Druidic associations with Yggdrasil are similar to those of Norse belief systems, in that the tree is a symbol of the world, togetherness, and strength. If you want me to sit here and explain to you the lore of a pumpkin wielded by Elizabeth Bathory in a Halloween dress with a plastic pitchfork, you're out of your goddamn mind. Instead, I offer you double trivia. The original jack-o'-lantern was lit by a coal from hell given to the titular Jack by Satan. The reason why Liz is a caster is because when idols retire, they become newscasters. I shit you not, that is the actual reason. The Tomamo Fan Club is a magazine detailing the various things that a quote-unquote good wife should do. I would like to take this moment to list the various crimes that Tomamo's supposed various historical counterparts parts committed. <clears throat> Inventing the brass toaster as a torture method. The meat garden. Throwing someone from the top of a tower. Witchcraft. Possession. Dismemberment. Manipulation. Inciting violence. Participating in incited violence. And the list goes on. All of this while continuing a path of seduction to a powerful husband. By the way, best Extella girl. While you may initially believe that Medea's infinite pancakes is just a weird cutesy thing tacked onto a character that we often see as being somewhat cutthroat, the first recorded instance of pancakes were actually from the ancient Greeks. They were originally made of wheat, honey, curdled milk, and olive oil. All of the extra fixins like whipped cream and maple syrup only served 
work to improve them, and I'll be damned if no one in ancient Greece ever thought to not put berries on their pancakes. Medea may not be too far off the mark with the idea that sweets can solve many of the world's problems. Nursery Rhymes Bonsi is a personal favorite of mine. While on the surface, it's just Wonderland, the impossible land from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, from the description though, it digs more into the actual thought process behind Wonderland's construction and where it exists among us. Wonderland is a place for all, but people often forget the joys of childish wonder that life has to offer. Consequently, something so commonplace as clouds can go from looking like pink cotton candy to dreary shagged wool. The importance of indulging in nonsense was something that Lewis Carroll explored constantly. His literary works reflect this appreciation for creativity over common sense, and how with just a little bit of imagination, even the most mundane things can become fantastical. The Rhyme CE attempts to capture that same level of whimsy in his description. Paracelsus' Bon CE is incredibly confusing and weird if you know nothing about him, and I'll cover his life at some point in the future, but not right now. For now though, know that he is somebody who believed in the power of the four elements, those being fire, water, earth, and air. Each element had a corresponding elemental, salamanders for fire, undines for water, gnomes for earth, and sylphs for air. Paracelsus himself believed that these were something between physical and spiritual, existing somewhere in the line between, appearing mostly humanoid and participating in human-like routines such as sleeping and dressing and clothing. The difference engine was the precursor to all modern computers. This is using the term computer in its most archaic form, which is something used for computation, or the solving of mathematical problems. So more accurately, it is closer to being a giant calculator as opposed to a modern computer. Babbage was given funding by the government, but then they soon realized that Babbage's plans were far from cost-effective, and as a result they had it shelved forever incomplete. That said, he did make a one-seventh scale version of the original, which did actually function as intended. It is from these very blueprints that future generations would draw inspiration for the device that you are using to watch this video laying sideways in your bed or in the background of your losing League of Legends game. Helena is one of those figures in history who you do research on or read about, and then you take a step back and just ask yourself the very simple question, what? There is a lot of very compelling evidence that she had some very real connection to the occult in her life. The name of the CE, Concealed Goddess, is almost certainly a direct reference to her book Isis Unveiled, Isis of course referring to the Egyptian goddess. This book is incredibly confusing and dense and would take an actual wizard to fully understand what it's trying to get across. The highlights of the book are its discussions of occultism with things like elementals, esotericism, and the connections between the various religious scripts throughout the world. The book itself is a self-described plea for people to get back to exploring a religion founded on knowledge, and with that knowledge we as a species could ascend to higher planes of reality. That is, of course, if I'm understanding it well enough, which I very likely am not. Thomas Edison was nothing if not persistent. He built an entire career based on trying new things to improve less efficient models and then improving upon those improvements. Despite what you may believe, Edison is not the inventor of the light bulb. Rather, he is the one who came up with the most popular version of it, using a filament of carbon and bamboo. The idea behind this CE in particular is more about persisting through failure and learning from it. If you fail 1000 times but succeed on the 1001st attempt, then you have succeeded. It is better to fail and learn than to only ever succeed and remain clueless. Good old G-Man's Bon CE is self-explanatory because its description is literally just the story, so I'm just going to read it to you. One day, Coyote went to visit the son, but found that he wasn't home, but his wife was. Coyote claimed to be son's cousin, and said that he'd come by to smoke and talk, and ask for son's tobacco pouch. He then filled his own pouch with the tobacco without the wife noticing, rolled a cigarette, and waited for a bit before leaving. When son came back, he was angry and gave chase following the ashes on the ground. However, it started to rain, and eventually the tobacco in Coyote's pouch began to sprout and fell out all over the ground, and the ashes washed away, so Sun went home. Coyote stayed in an Apache camp but refused to share the tobacco. The Apache made a plan and dressed a young boy as a woman to give the Coyote as his new wife and a new home for him to stay in exchange for the tobacco. Coyote gave all of his tobacco away and tried to spend the night with his new wife, but the cross-dressing boy refused his advances. Finally, Coyote impatiently grabbed his wife and found her to be a man. When Coyote began to yell at the Apache, they refused to give back the tobacco and just smoked it and laughed. The Dress of Heaven is a mystic code with an incredible amount of power. Its wearer becomes connected to the Holy Grail as was seen in Fate Zero, their personality soon merges with it as the Grail War progresses. This is all an attempt to reclaim the miracle of third magic that the founder of the Einsburn line had achieved. Sansa sees her noble steed Bai Long. Bai Long is in actuality a dragon prince who was sentenced to death for destroying a sacred pearl. However, Guan Yin, a bodhisattva, stepped in and pleaded for the dragon's life. 
He was then placed in a river and instructed to help Sanzong, but instead accidentally attacked them and ate the monk's horse. To apologize for this, he took the form of a white horse and would serve Sanzong as a mount for the remainder of her journey. Nidokris's unused royal authority is a direct description of her pharaoh life. She never truly took the opportunity to use her authority after becoming the Queen of Egypt, but instead used her position to get others where she needed them to be to enact her vengeance. It also points out that her rash behavior in life is why she is assumed to reign Chaldea, which is kind of cute. Da Vinci's Bonsi is kind of all over the place and much more philosophical philosophical than anything else, which in hindsight makes it a perfect CE for Da Vinci. Da Vinci was a man of many passions. He loved animals enough that he was supposedly a vegetarian and would purchase birds in cages just to set them free. In the reverse direction, however, he would also dissect animals to see how they worked from the inside and would draw diagrams of such. But most of all in this, the titular universal wisdom is that one must always seek to improve the world, and to do that you need to first improve yourself. Good words to live by. No Crab and Marie's Bonsi easier out of 10. While there is no historical significance in the picture, there is some found in the description. She talks about a royal retreat called the Petit Trion, which was a gift to her from her husband. It served as a place for the queen and only the queen, with access only given to those who were personally invited by the queen. After the French Revolution, the grounds were ransacked and stripped, and more or less left to simply rot. They would be restored by Napoleon as a gift to his sister, Pauline. Perhaps the only redeeming thing in Prilia can be found here, the class card install. The idea is that through the use of magecraft, one can infuse themselves with an aspect of a heroic spirit, temporarily gaining their powers and abilities. This allows for a normal mage to perform actions such as riding the Pegasus or wielding Excalibur, which would otherwise be impossible. The Tablets of Destiny, a divine artifact in Mesopotamian mythology that was more or less a legal doctrine declaring the one who held it to be the supreme ruler of everything. The monstrous Anzu bird once attempted to seize control of the world by stealing these tablets, but was hunted down and killed for this indiscretion. The tablets themselves would be passed down at one point to Kingu by Tiamat as well. If you're interested, that's all in the Behind the Servants Tiamat video. Realistically speaking, Merlin often finds himself dead or trapped at the end of all of his stories, but fate seems to have taken his demise in the direction, written by Lever de Gruel, in which Merlin is confined in a beautiful crystal tower that only he can perceive, but to others is simply air. Fate seems to have removed the part though where he is in that tower the lover where he spends his days making merry. The bedchamber of King Shuriar seems rather fitting for Scheherazade. It was the location where she would entertain the bloodthirsty king in her stories. A battlefield of the wits covered in silk, from these chambers Scheherazade would weave a story every night to the king, always leaving off on a note that kept the king's interest so he never ended up turning on her. I already talked about the Domus Araya and Saver Nero's Bonsi, and this is essentially the exact same thing, but the extra bit tacked on translates to Rainbow Sea, giving it a nice summary theming. Circe is rather famous for her feasts and banquets, and all for the exact wrong reasons. Circe, in myth, has a knack for enchanting her food so that when Odysseus' crew eats it, they are all turned into pigs. Despite that, the lavish planning she puts into the meals is important because if it were not enticing, then what would the point of a feast be? The Queen of Sheba sent tribute to King Solomon upon his learning that the Kingdom of Sheba was the only one not subservient to him. These tributes included ships carrying treasures and inortly adorned youths, all of whom came bearing a letter declaring that the Queen of Sheba would make the journey to Solomon in three years rather than seven. Among these gifts would be Sheba's visit, which according to some accounts is what produced their son, Nebuchadnezzar. Atma is an abbreviation of the Romanov sisters Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and... Anastasia. The sisters were all very close to one another, and as such would actually sign some of the letters addressed from all of them with the same abbreviation, Atma. Anastasia and Maria, the third sister, were exceptionally close and were often referred to as the Little Pair. Avisbron is notable for his works in the field of philosophy far above his representation as a golem maker. One of his predominant fields that he would discuss was the material of the soul and morality. However, Avisbron lived the life of a noble, shielded from many of the woes of the common people, and as such did not suffer as they did. Thus, this Bonsi calls into question how someone can preach about being a good or just moral person while not living the life of those that experience all that pain. Of course, it is worth mentioning that we really don't have much information on Avisbron's life, and even for a very long time, people thought his most famous works were written by a completely different person. Realistically, this bond CE more closely represents his actions in Apocrypha, where he kills his master for his ideals, part of which is to make a world where death and war are not present. Sticking with Apocrypha content, we have Sieg's bond CE titled Nameless Death. This one hurts because it touches on cruelty and the uncaring nature of the universe. This is taken directly from a scene in Apocrypha where Sieg attempts to save the life of a random homunculus, but she ends up dying regardless. The moment of contemplation that this girl was created solely to be a battery much like himself and possessed a significant level of sentience but had no destiny, no future, and a name that now nobody ever knows. She was a casualty to existence and is destined to be forgotten as such. 
On that note, go watch Gurren Lagann. Unfortunately for you Scotty fans, this crown is not one that exists in myth. Instead, this is likely to represent the transition from Scotty being a Jotun herself to becoming a goddess. She originally came into conflict with the gods after they killed her father Thatsi, but agreed to join them after some discussion. By discussion, I am including the fact that negotiations included Loki playing tug-of-war with a nanny goat using his balls. Historically, a match offender is a type of oni that doesn't exist, but did you know the first Magical Girl anime aired in 1966 and was called Sally the Witch? Miyu's Bonsi is her recollection of her mother's love. Her bloodline had magical powers marked by red eyes, and was able to read the minds of people with wishes and grant them. As a side effect, it took a major mental strain on the girls and would often kill them. So, they took care to hide the girls born this way and shielded them away from the wishes of others. Miyu herself fell into this category and was raised in a cold, emotionless environment. Despite this, her mother would still play with her because despite how she appeared on the outside, she did love her dearly on the inside. Murasaki is drawing a picture scroll of her tale of Genji Chapter 9, Aoi. Aoi is the name of Genji's wife who he initially dislikes, leading him to search for love elsewhere. He later returns to his wife and they reconcile with each other and have a child. However, Aoi herself dies soon after and Genji begins a relationship with another woman named... Murasaki. Whether this is the reasoning as to why it's her preferred chapter or because of the recollection is unknown to me. The reason why the snake is coiled around Asclepius' staff is because while working one day, Asclepius was stamping the ground with his staff. Unknowingly, he killed a passing snake in this manner. A second snake appeared with an herb in its mouth and gave it to the dead snake. This revived him and Asclepius was able to identify the herb. This is what allowed him to create the elixir of resurrection. Ever since, snakes, notable for their molting and being associated with healing, were a common sight at Asclepian temples. A a moment of reflection near the end of Chen Gong's life. This CE takes place while he is being besieged and coming to realize that he has lost. Gong knows the rules that those who surrender to Xiao Xiao will be spared, but he had no intention of doing so and instead would decide to die alongside Lu Bu after they were both captured. This CE is meant to capture that in-between moment of the bloodshed where Gong can really sit back and think about what was to come. Castoria's Bon CE is directly tied to her role in Lost Belt 6, but I'm opting to not spoil that, so instead let's talk about the real Avalon. In the original Welsh myth, Morgan is the ruler of Avalon alongside her nine sisters, and is a place of magic only accessible by the sea. The island is a paradise where everything is self-maintained and apple trees grow in a great forest. In fact, Avalon loosely means the island of apples. Cloth creation has always been a central part to Crane's legend. She was able to create cloth of the finest qualities just from her feathers, too much pain to herself, which is what it caused her to eventually leave after being seen making the cloth. The relevance of the sketchbook is a nice nod to her event. Welcome back to Summer Sea East with no real historical precedent. The form of magic on display here is actually illusionism, which is simply deception done for the sake of entertainment. No actual magic is required from the user, so even a one-star assassin can learn a trick or two. The god in question in Izumo Sea is actually a samurai named Nagoya Sansaburo. The kicker here is that there is no evidence that Izumo and Sanzaburo ever met, despite him being depicted by her as a lover in Kabuki plays. The real Sanzaburo would likely not be remembered in history if not for Izumo, because he really didn't do anything exceptional in his own right. While the historical Martha never used Terrace as a traveling kitchen, this may be a good time to explain just why she appears in the aggro state that she does. This is because in the Bible, when going to meet Jesus, Martha was very aggressive and impatient, not rude or disrespectful, but closer to panicked worry. This prompted her much calmer sister to be the one to really talk to Jesus and lead him to their home. The rats are servants of Daikokuten. Daikokuten often shares some association with Bishamaten, who is also a god associated with rats and mice. Rats are familiars to the god, being present in much of his art. The designation from simply being a rat to becoming a servant of a god seems to be what has changed in Chaldea's Daikokuten. Also, if you read the fine print, they only mention changing from feeling the need to scrounge for food and are still down for breathing. The yellow turban is a very clear homage to Zhang's yellow turban rebellion. The Yellow Turban Rebellion was a peasant uprising against the Han Dynasty after a series of corrupt government officials took power, mixed with massive flooding, that led to peasant exploitation. Zhang Zhu and his brothers started preaching for reformation and eventually pulled a small military force together and chose their uniform to be the titular Yellow Turbans. In an attempt to avoid the ghosts that come with Summer, Wu has brought with her a series of Taoist exorcism tools with the plan to turn any ghost she finds into a Zhang Zhi. Zhang Zhi, also known as Hopping Vampires, are often depicted as wearing the robes of a man Mandarin, with a sealing talisman upon their head. The talisman is the important part because it is what prevents the Zhangxi from killing people and stealing their qi. As such, Wu has prepared the necessary equipment to make sure that she can exercise any unruly ghosts. If you are aware of any Bon CE, it is this one. The castle of the Einsburn family and a place where a heroic giant tried to protect a little girl, the helmet of Sir Lancelot was made with the express purpose of hiding his true identity. It's much easier in a standard Holy Grail war to be perceived as the quote-unquote Black Knight. Also, where the mind may fail in 
remembering the Path of Knighthood, this appearance can be seen as the last vestige of who he is. Fun fact, this CE is being described by Chen Gong, or at least that's the impression that it gives off. This CE gives us an explanation as to why Lu Bu uses this weapon, the Heavenly Halberd. Ironically, Lu Bu is more known for being a master archer, but oh well. The Halberd is described as being a perfect weapon, one that meets every situation in hand-to-hand -hand combat effectively, if known how to be used properly. It can double as a spear, a sword, or bludgeon based on how it is swung, and while on horseback it makes for a perfect implement to dispatch enemies on the ground. Rebellion and Insurrection This CE stands to crystallize Spartacus's belief of fighting against the oppressed, be they men or beast. With a legion of 70 men and armed with stolen kitchen utensils, Spartacus led a slave rebellion and escaped the gladiatorial schools. While this would ultimately lead to his death to him and his comrades, it was better than living as a toy to the tyrants. There is no historical precedent for Kentoki having sunglasses, but fate plays around with this idea a fair amount. He wears the sunglasses to hide his blue eyes. There is a whole behind-the-scenes subtext about this, where it is revealed that it was not Raiko who killed Shuten, but rather Kentoki. His blue eyes are what made Shuten drop her guard for a brief moment that allowed him to kill her, so he now wears glasses to prevent the same thing from happening again. Here we see Vlad the Impaler, Vlad impaling people. Impalement is the act of torture or execution that involves skewering a person with a long object. This is the favored method of Vlad, who would do so supposedly by having the still-living person partially stabbed while horizontal and then have gravity work its magic, slowly piercing through the rest of them. It's a real not great way to go out. The threat of Ariadne was given to the Greek hero Theseus to help him navigate the Great Labyrinth. This made it so that after he was able to find the Minotaur, he could then also find his way out. Caligula's is odd. Let's start with the accusation against him of him sleeping with his sister Agrippina, the mother of Nero. In fate, Nero and Agrippina look identical, so the love he feels for her would be put into immediate question. The actual Caligula was most likely an epileptic, which is why his madness is blamed on the full moon. This CE, however, paints it that it was in fact the Roman Senate that was corrupt, and that he became mad on purpose to draw their ire in hopes that it would make Nero's rule more beautiful. While the Roman Senate was indeed corrupt, the second part of this is entirely a fabrication. First off, I want to note that the Assyrian Eudochris mentioned here is not the Egyptian one, so don't be confused. Second off, it is important to note that Darius III is debated as to whether he is even real because he doesn't exist in Persian sources, only Greek ones all of which make him out to be a villain to make Alexander seem even more great. The anecdote here about him going to the gates of Babylon and finding no treasure inside of it is all metaphorical, on needing more than just wealth to be a powerful ruler. Kiyohime's famous bell of the Dojoji Temple. After Anshin lied to her about marrying her, the scorned young girl chased after him. She turned into a fire-breathing serpent, sniffed out the monk hiding in the temple's bell, she breathed fire on it until it was white hot, and then drowned herself in the river, leaving nothing but a charred husk of the liar for the monks to dispose of. Kiyohime did nothing wrong. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen, that is my boy Eric Bloodaxe with the Eric Bloodaxe. The axe, in actuality, is metaphorical. He gained the name Bloodaxe because of the various acts of familicide he committed in order to sit upon the throne of Norway. This would be a continuing theme for him, and so the name is believed to be derived from his bloody ways. Tomacat, my beloved, was given this apron of a good wife by Cat Merlin in order to govern all of Chaldea. Only one who has mastered the culinary arts is able to wear it, making her the ideal wife. Or at least that's the lie that she's come up with for us to believe. The creation of a perfect human, to play God. While Fran is indeed perfect, her existence was one that came about because of man's own hubris. Life is sacred and complex, so the idea of lowly creatures such as humans attempting to usurp this power from the gods is a greater blasphemy than Prometheus stealing fire. Because it was an action done out of hubris, it resulted in errors, and the creator rejecting their own creation. I love that they tied this in, and we really do deserve an old man Beowulf. This is his final battle, long past his prime. He is alone with a singular shield bearer by his side, tasked with killing the great dragon who threatened his country. After arriving, all of his men save for the single knight flee in terror, and the dragon lands a fatal blow on Beowulf. However, together the pair muster an attack allowing the knight Wiglaf to land a blow with his sword, and Beowulf a fatal blow with his dagger. The old king, as he lays dying, declares his bravest subject to be the future king. This is perhaps the best word to describe Nightingale as a person. Indomitable, meaning to be impossible to defeat. Nightingale was a person who worked for her entire life and never gave up the pursuit of teaching others the way of healing. Where many would and have allowed their achievements to simply be shelved and rest in the knowledge that they made a difference, Nightingale never stopped until she died. The one-man war is certainly how I would describe Kualtar. This CE is meant to show his achievements in the America Singularity, where he was unmatched as a warrior time and time again. This CE simply goes to describe that this rendition of Ku is the crystallization of his might, neglecting all other aspects in favor of war. War. 
Raiko's Bansi is the Dojigiri Yasutsuna, or simply the Dojigiri, or Doji Killer. This is the sword that supposedly killed Shuten Doji and still exists today in the Tokyo Museum. I swear this one is legit just a pun. Like, seriously, Bone Sword Nameless. There is also no historical precedent for it, it's literally just an Emmy a joke. It's a parody of R2-D2 but made to resemble the Helmet of Lancelot. It is described as being loyal exclusively to Echan and looks down on humans. The Hayori of the Shinsengumi hung up rather than worn. This is for a few reasons. Hijikata actually lived long enough to be part of the group that the Shinsengumi evolved into. Near the end of the war, they knew that they had lost. The Tokugawa had surrendered and Edo was lost, but still they fought in now pointless fight. It became a battle for principle over what was actually able to be won, and Hijikata became the true embodiment of this movement. I can say this with confidence because it was only with his death that the movement fell apart. I can't confirm the historiosity of this one, but I don't believe that that's the point. This one is very reminiscent of Anastasia's Atma, as it is just a normal moment shared between sisters in the past, not knowing the tragedy that would befall their futures as they slowly became consumed in flames. Though unconfirmed, I'm going to treat this as it is implied. The Girdle of Hippolyta was the object of desire for Heracles' ninth labor. It was a gift from the Amazons from the war god Ares. Hippolyta, in most renditions, willingly gives Heracles the belt, impressed by his stature and achievement. It's only when Hera gets involved spreading rumors among the Amazonian ranks does Heracles get attacked. In the confusion of it all, Hippolyta is killed by Heracles who then flees with the girdle. As to how it ended up in Penn's possession is unknown to me. The frontier was what the unexplored parts of America were referred to. In the legends of Paul Bunyan, much of what we know about the frontier was created through his actions, and it was through his tireless work that settlers were able to make it all one country. Nobu's hit summer album, the collector's edition, includes a t-shirt and headphones, but if none sell then she's just going to give them away anyway, so whatever. So I discovered in my research that the pelt of the Caledonian boar was actually attested to be real. In the second century, it was still on display in the Temple of Athena, though because of its advanced age, it was barely recognizable, and sieges from the bastard Romans had resulted in the thievery of its tusks, leaving it as little more than just a moldy old pelt. A crystallized memory of our time with Jolter. In other words, all of our failed Dojin copies after we got stuck into Bibi's time loop. We are being forced to read all of them with Jolter, and to act as her silencer should she get too embarrassed about the past. This one I find very interesting. It is, of course, not historically accurate in the slightest, however, it does call some things into mind. Firstly, we've seen human Zhang Yu before. Not any full artwork or anything like a sprite, but it has appeared in flashbacks before. These are the blueprints to make the original 1.0 of Zhang Yu. So over time, he became more the robotic centaur that we see now. The implications of this are, of course, that a more human Zhang Yu may be summonable in the future. This is another of my favorite Bonsai's because again, it shows the growth of character that Arjun Alter has been going through. He went from something akin to a machine, weeding out imperfection in any form and eliminating it with impunity to openly admit that the thing he, an all-powerful god created, was imperfect. He claimed that this was allowed to happen because he was asked to be himself, and so he decided to learn. He is changing to understand humans in a way that is impossible for a god that knows all. So, after scouring the internet to try and find the proper translation of Mori's will and testament, I am happy to inform you that what is written in the FGO version is pretty much exactly what it was like, with only some embellishments to match how he is portrayed. The requests are the same, the wording is different. Give his tea jar and tea sets to Hideyoshi, as Nobu was dead by now. Have Hideyoshi give money to his mom so that she can move to Kyoto where she'll be safe. Put a stronger general in charge of Kaneyama, and have all of the women there sent home. All unlabeled tea things go to Senchio, as well as a short sword and, and everything else to who they are labeled with. Mori wants his daughter to marry a doctor or a merchant, and definitely not a samurai. Make sure his mom gets to Kyoto safe, and do not let Senchio take over Kaneyama. In the event of a catastrophic defeat, burn the whole thing down. Senchio, by the way, was Tokugawa Ieyasu. A little fun thing with Salome is that it's heavily implied that she has killed her past masters, and that is why she has so many skulls. The main skull, though, belongs to John the Baptist, which was specifically requested by her to be given on a platter as a reward for her dancing. She did this to please her mother after John had called her marriage unlawful. Another summer CE with the main draw being the discussion of how special the summer was to the servant. The difference is that this would be Musashi's last summer and she could somehow detect that, making it more impactful as she went all out to have the time of her life. According to some versions of the tale, Kijokio was originally named Kureha, but given the court name Momiji, she would 
play the Koto in the court to Imperial audiences and drew the attention of a samurai lord. However, rumors spread that she had planned to kill the samurai's main wife and she was exiled while pregnant with his child. After this, she was believed to become the leader of a bandit group and would be killed for this. It is important to remember that the claims of Oni are often only just historically bandits, so this ties these two connections together well. Bryn and Sigurd offer a gift of apology for wandering off and fucking several times during the summer break when we were in the middle of getting murdered. The gifts include sweets and vegetable juices, which are noted to be in the sharp eyes of the child spirits who may want some. This one has no real basis in history outside of the location, which is Cyprus. This one merely explains the joy for both the country she was born in and the king who made her, and how happy she was at the time. She even comments that she is unsure of whether at the time that she was human or statue and that it didn't matter because the joy that she felt was real regardless. Alright, so it should go without saying that a lot of these are kind of spoilers for characters anyway, but this one's a massive spoiler for Morgan, so here we go. This is the tale of Morgan who gave up everything she had in promise to pursue her own dream. She was given the opportunity to become a soul of the planet and be beloved by all, but this was not her desire. She wanted a land of her own, and as such was changed. She became the ruler of a land all on her own and rejected her destiny, but accomplished her dream instead. Kakigori is a summertime suite in Japan. Calling it shaved ice is wrong because it's just not the same. American and European snow cones ain't shit to Kakigori. What is most interesting here is the first recorded instance of Kakigori comes from Sei's pillow book, describing it as a sweet served to the aristocracy made of fluffy ice with syrup atop it. 1,000 years later, she still hasn't figured out how to eat it slowly to avoid brain freezes. The Bloodied Rheingold. Where the Rheingold in Siegfried's Bonsie sits at the bottom of a river, here it has been upheaved and now covered in blood. This is to show the amount of blood that Krimhild herself drew out in eradicating those that killed her husband over the treasure. Pom-poms used by Ibuki during her summer. She believes that shaking them will make one's magical energy rise, which I guess is one way to call it. The original pom-poms were first made of paper back in the 1930s and have evolved since to be more rounded and flamboyant. Riku uses a nice explanation as to why she is summoned how she is. Riku is described as an angry spirit, like water, flowing out violently everywhere but free. Komahime is a sad spirit, like a flower drifting alone in a river. The two souls met and felt sorry for one another and decided to comfort each other. As such, they became intrinsically linked in a singular spirit, soothing each other's pains and fears. Together though, they have accepted the one who summoned them and are pleased that we are who we are. The Dice Game of Shakuni One of the most famous tales of the Mahabharata, this was a plot by Shakuni to strip the Pandevas of their power and humiliate them. Using a pair of rigged dice, Duryodhana slowly took everything from the Pandevas in a gambling match. Eventually getting to the point where they were all enslaved to him, before you go and say, well, why didn't the Pandavas just stop playing if it was clear that Duryodhana was cheating, it is the exact same reason why an aristocrat died of his bladder exploding rather than leave the presence of the king. Etiquette. This game came to a head when Duryodhana tried to have the wife of the Pandavas disrobed in front of the court, but divine intervention prevented this. This one is very tied into Castoria's Lost Belt 6 story, so much like the Morgan one, if you've not cleared Lost Belt 6, I'd recommend skipping this one. Near the end of Lost Belt 6, Castoria is subjected to reliving her life in the form of seasons. Each of these is represented by a different type of memory that she will reflect upon. Her beginnings in the summer, her challenges in the fall, her worst memories in winter, and then her most pleasant memories in spring. What we are given is truly terrible visions of her life up through the first three, and finally when we get to see the springtime of Castoria's life, it ends within seconds. Castoria and Fairy England had no spring memories. No joy, no love, no positive memories whatsoever. Everything that she ever did was to please others rather than herself, and as such, she never actually felt happy. What this has to do with this CE is that these are happy moments for her. This is Castoria finally experiencing spring memories, things that she can definitively clutch to her heart as happy times. The decision of making them photographs ties back into the same idea as George's CE, as something that can also be left behind. It is physical proof that at one point in her existence, she was able to be happy with someone she truly enjoys and was surrounded by friends who loved her in return. Jeans is her divine revelation to save the people of France. Joan of Arc is one of the most compelling and bizarre people to exist ever. People can make arguments as to whether or not she actually heard the voice of God or if she was a good commander all they want, but the historical record from both sides agree that she was weird. There is a list of revelations that she attributed to the voice of God, one very famously being that she went to a church and essentially said, I'm getting my sword, and found an ancient sacred sword that had been there for centuries, that there was no 
no way that she could have ever known about. She was weird enough to have actual people of the cloth scared of her revelations. The flag of Amakusa Shiro is a real relic that exists today. This was his personal banner that read, Praise be to the Most Holy Sacrament. Other posters of this ilk were placed around Hojo Castle, that he and his group of rebelling Christians had taken over from the Shogunate in hopes of raising morale. Jacob's limbs are in reference to the leader of the Israelites, Jacob. Jacob is a fairly prominent figure in the Old Testament, and quite frankly, I don't have the time to get into his various exploits, so let's talk about why he is anti-divine, demon, and undead. This is because during his journey home from Canaan, he set up camp along a river. Suddenly, a man, in quotes, came to him and the pair wrestled. Jacob held his own against the man until sunrise when the fighting stopped. The man, who was actually an angel, refused to give Jacob his identity, but instead gave Jacob a new name, Israel, which would forever after be the name of his people. This battling with the divine entity by the waterside is what gives these sacred arms their power. Sherlock Holmes's prized violin, a Stradivarius, these violins and other stringed instruments of the sort are more akin to modern mythological items. Supposedly, they are able to produce a more beautiful sound than any other stringed instrument and are widely acclaimed for their craftsmanship. In modern times, people claim they sound identical to other high-grade violins, yet this doesn't diminish the value of the name of the craftsman. As to why this is associated with Holmes, I am not familiar enough with every Sherlock story to say what brand he uses, but the anecdote is that he found it in a pawn shop only recognized by his analytical eye for its true value, making for a sweet little tale. While the Epping Palace is a real place, that is not what is being referred to here. I think an aspect of Lost Belt 3 that is oft forgotten is that Shi Huang Di's true body is the palace. Over the course of the 2,000 some years it took to conquer the Earth, he sacrificed his human form and evolved into something more. His form, a perfect human, made into a miniature form, is presented to us as a gift now that he acknowledges us as equals. This is not meant to be an act of intimidation, but rather one where he wants us to remember how hard that he had worked. Also, never forget that this Chin Shi Huang walked to Chaldea through the Lost Belt because he is literally that guy. I love that they call Called this the feathered serpent and then give us a featherless dinosaur and yes i know they're actually called pterosaurs nerd the association with this particular fossilized friend is that they share the same name as the ancient god being called quetzalcoatlus as to their association with christmas how about shut up much of astraya's design in fgo is taken from two places taro and lady justice both portray a woman holding a scale to weigh the heaviness of one's sins, and a sword to symbolize how punishment can be final. In actuality, the scale motif goes all the way back to ancient Egyptian mythology with the weight of one's heart being weighed against the feather of truth. Roulette is my personal favorite form of gambling that isn't gotcha, but that is aside from the point. It was believed to be first invented in the 18th century by the French and gained popularity near the end of the century. The idea behind the game is guess where the ball on the spinning wheel will land, and place bets on where it will go. Theoretically, this is one of the most fair forms of gambling with outside interference, being difficult to hide, and the excitement of watching the ball spin around gets the blood pumping. Yes, I know this is actually a game that can be rigged in the modern day, the fact that it is shaped like the round table for the CE is irrelevant. The favored mirror of the first Queen of Japan. According to the description, this mirror was a gift from her brother who was forgotten by history and serves as a way for her to remember him. Interestingly enough, it's recorded that he was her only male attendant after she became queen and acted as her direct emissary. The relevance of mirrors in Shintoism is fairly large. For one, a mirror is labeled among the sacred treasures of Japan. For two, they are treated as stand-ins for the gods, as was decreed by the sun goddess Amaterasu. There's also the belief that mirrors are sacred because they only reflect the truth. They are incapable of hiding imperfections and simply reflect what is before them. This CE is a direct reference to the end of Hollow Ataraxia, which makes no sense because this rendition of Karen is one that has supposedly not met Avenger. I'm not going to spoil the ending for a visual novel, but this CE makes no sense in the context. If you could believe it, summer CEs still have no bearing on reality, and the vast majority of them can simply be summed up by saying, well, that was a great summer. This one is no different, but the description describes the dinos there as plushies, but they look extremely like robots, which just throws me through a loop. Also, R.I.P. Steggy. I shit you not, this is an explanation from young Moriarty on why math is actually evil. Math has been described as its own language and a universal one at that. It is for this reason why on the Voyager probe there is an equation to solve how to use the golden disk, because in theory, math is concrete throughout the universe and any advanced enough species should be able to figure it out. For this, math can be viewed as good, but Moriarty wants us to know that math is actually something vile because subtraction indicates loss and equations when using the lives of others results in negative consequences. I still can't do long division, so this is completely lost on me. A pair of wedding rings fit for both a giant and 
and a mortal. Given that I am unfamiliar with Summer Scotty's event because I was moving at the time of its release, I don't know Scotty's aspirations to marry in that tale. I can say though that the rings themselves are made for a giant man who wishes to marry a mortal woman and vice versa. So let's not forget that before she was a goddess, Scotty was a giant. Magatamas are sacred objects in Japan, being listed among the three treasures as the jewel. By the way, if you bond ten Himiko, Io, and Ibuki, you will have all three sacred treasures, which is actually pretty neat. The relevance of the Magatama to Io is that after the death of Himiko, Io, at the age of 13, inherited the kingdom and was sent 5,000 white Magatamas and two jade Magatamas. The lore of this particular Bonsi is all a fake creation from what I'm finding, but the idea of her being cursed with a corrupted sacred object is interesting. Io is a difficult enough person to research that adding the little tidbits like this is just kind of fun. A diary given to us by the Popus Johanna filled with her thoughts of her life in Chaldea. This one is very reminiscent of George's in that it was made as a way for us to remember the servant by even after our journey has come to an end. The difference between this one and George's that gives it more impact comes with the knowledge that the records of the Popus are nearly non-existent, and the ones that do exist were either destroyed or faked. Historically, it doesn't line up for there to have been a female Pope, but the addition of anti-female Pope countermeasures after a certain time lends a granule of credence to these theories, but not much. So, this is her attempt at proving to not the world, but to us, that she did exist, and that we should remember her. With the coming of the summer holiday, Melusine has shown her true colors. During the events of Summer 8, a race between us and Melusine takes place, where we ultimately defeat her. However, the implications here are that in a separate loop, she managed to snag a trophy herself. That said, she doesn't particularly care for it, and rather wants what she considers the real prize, i.e. Gudiko. Uesugi Kenshin is somewhat odd, falling into the common theme of Guda Guda rambling with the intention of feeling historically relevant. This CE mostly seems to serve as an act of pondering her existence as a quote-unquote god of war, and whether or not her strength comes from the possession, or if it's herself that allows the possession to be strong in the first place. Chateau de If is a real prison fortress on an island found in Marseille, France. In the novel The Count of Monte Cristo, this is where Dantes was held for 14 years before he escaped, and learned a great deal from a priest who was also held there. Much of this information is what would later assist Dantes in enacting his revenge. The death of Joan of Arc forever immortalized into the walking charred demon that is Jalter. The martyrdom performed on a young saint now is able to be inflicted upon others with gross impunity by her darkened reflection. The last splinter is in reference to two things. The flower is a Hortensia flower, and the last splinter naming refers to his mental state. This Angra Mainyu is not the real one, but rather a scapegoat, a normal man taken by his people and turned into a sacrificial lamb of all the world's evil. The love that was given to him by a single Hortensia is what keeps him from truly forgetting who he is. Chrysor is the name of the Gorgon's lesser known child and brother to the Pegasus. Both he and Pegasus are considered to be the children of Poseidon after he defiled Medusa, but both were only born after Medusa herself was decapitated. Chrysor has a few myths related to him, and is most famous for fathering monsters with an oceanid. Lobo was considered to be impossible to kill because he was far too smart for normal traps and poisons, and too powerful to be killed with a firearm. However, his mate, the wife wolf Blanca, was not on the same level. As such, Setan and others who were tasked with dealing with Lobo opted to kill the mate to draw out the king. They managed to do this, and it was said that upon finding his partner dead, Lobo himself lost the will to resist. While Salieri and Mozart certainly were not on friendly terms during their lives, the notion that Salieri killed Mozart sprung up decades after after Mozart's death. The popularization of this theory in modern times can very likely be attributed to the pair's portrayal in the film, Amadeus. So a realistic wildfire like hatred from one another is simply untrue. If anything, Mozart hated Salieri who tried to keep him down and out of the court life. I feel like Nobu CEs and Summer CEs are in the same vein of being weird. This sword is described as being an amalgamation of every sword Nobunaga owned, waiting on the edges of eternity for her return. It will remain upright for this amount of time until the right time comes, except because it's Nobu related, it immediately immediately falls over after this picture is taken. So this is kind of a cute one. It's Space Ishtar's ship. Come back to collect us after the events of Saber Wars 2, because Ishtar needs our help again. The sweet thing about this one is that while the goodbyes we had at the end of Saber Wars 2 seemed fairly final, we could always count on a useless goddess to show up when we least expect her to. Azamaru was the sword of Taira no Kagekiyo. Its association with being a cursed item comes from when it was gifted to one of Nobunaga's retainers, Niwa Nagahide. After receiving the sword, Nagahide began developing eye troubles until he was nearly 
blind. It was believed that the sword was the source of these problems, after which it was donated to a shrine where it remains today. After it was no longer in his possession, his eyes returned to normal. In an attempt to corrupt people with the temptations of summer, food, floaties, drinks, and the sun, it would appear as though Kama herself has fallen into human depravity. This CE gave me brain mold. It's an explanation of how Ranmaru became the number one Ranmaru on the planet of Ranmaru, where all Ranmaru's compete to become the true Ranmaru. Summer Eris has discovered that her likeness has been stolen and that she has been turned into a marketable plushie, as is the fate of all with fans. Amit is a goddess of the underworld composed of the three largest man-eaters of ancient Egypt, the crocodile, the lion, and the hippo. Amit helps to oversee the judgment of the dead, being the one who ultimately disposes of the wicked by devouring their hearts. While I call her a goddess, she was not an object of worship, but rather one that was greatly feared. Should you be deemed unworthy and your heart devoured, you would wander as a soulless husk for all eternity. Also, the flavor text indicates that even though this version of Nido is closer to the god Anubis, she is still a little bit afraid of Ozzy, which is adorable. So as not to linger on anything related to Chloe, her bonsi is a shared moment between her and Gudiko at a poolside. It's implied that Chloe has taken a liking to the master because of her constant hard work and dedication at attempting to meet deadlines. Bibi's bonsi is a memory of the Moon Cell and her interactions with Hakuno. Spoilers for Fate Extra stuff, this one likens itself to one of the game's endings where Bibi slash Sakura saves Hakuno by giving them a body without an illness outside the Moon Cell. I believe that this is the one considered to be the true ending. Unironically, this CE is Bibi killing us. Kind of. It's indicative that BB is manipulating reality as she sees fit to keep us perpetually trapped in time and be used as her plaything. It's easy to forget because BB is used as a wacky gag character a lot, but she possesses within her the powers of one of the most terrifying outer gods and has morals that are loose at best. A gift from Jinako. The sweets are a reference to Fate Extra, but the Bon CE itself is a reflection of her role in Lost Belt 4, and Ganesha gently explaining that even a shut in neat like her is capable of greatness. The Shen is a mythological creature in Japan. Korea and China that gave off the appearance of cities under the water. Today, it is widely believed that this was caused by optical illusions similar to the Fata Morgana. This is a reference to the temporary conclusion of Ark's story, reminiscing on words said to her by Shiki. Several amaryllis lilies, also known as naked ladies, placed next to a figure of Hakuno, reminiscing on the person who first taught her about love. There is discussion about whether this CE is referring to Hakuno or one of the Gudas, and I would say it could be both. Though Hakuno was the one who initially accepted her and taught her love, in her FGO manifestation she is undoubtedly in the love camp for the Gudas. Regardless, though, it's a very sweet CE that shows growth as a character, which is always nice. This one is much like the previous. Honestly, the explored concept of the love for these characters is interesting for me. Given that both are essentially mechanical crystallizations of emotions, seeing them learn an emotion that is truly human and foreign to them and wrap it into what they know is heartwarming. The Little Mermaid, Dreams of the Cradle. These are the thoughts that possessed a sickly young girl who had lofty expectations put upon her. As she lay alone, she cared not for those around her, but clung to the childish books of fairy tales for comfort. Honestly, as much as people hate Kiara, I find her to be a fascinating character. I only wish that she was more fleshed out. A microphone that was designed as something similar to a heart circuit for Mecha Ellie. This is something that is only able to be produced by increasing the bond with her pilot, and upon reaching a certain level of bond, it manifests to fit into her chest. In other words, it's akin to crystallized love or something of that nature. By all accounts, it's a microphone and your key to a full-on concert by Elizabeth. While that may sound hellish, I will say this though. It is important to remember that when Liz is singing for somebody else, she's actually great at it, so this is much less of a hell than it may seem. Mecha Ellie 2's true form is that of the giant Mecha Elizabeth that stands above the Himeji Sejus Pyramid Castle, or whatever the fuck it's called. It acts as this tower's guardian, and while it is pilotable, it consumes a massive amount of magical energy to do so, and thus should be avoided. The name of Okita Alter's sword is Rengoku. The name simply means purgatory, a realm of nothingness and waiting. The concept behind this is that it is an area between life and death where one is neither punished for their sins nor rewarded for their good deeds. It's simply a place between. It is in this place that Okita's other self resided until her time was called to assist the world as a counter guardian. Bloodstains on a snowy forest. This is very clearly a memory of Shitonai's vessel, Ilya, and this Ilya is the one from Fate Stay Night. The blood in the snow of the one who protected her is very obviously her. A wedding dress made for King Protea to fulfill her wish of wanting to be a cute bride. Due to her size and inexperience with love, much like her sisters, KP has somewhat a skewed view of emotion. She got it in her head that brides are the ideal of cuteness, and Hakuno in the Foxtail storyline managed to convince her to wait for him, teaching her about real love. This is a continuation of that dream of hers, the genuine good ending for such a good girl. Also, in the event that you somehow never picked up on this, the flowers present in all of the Sakura Girls' Bond CEs correspond with their names, Amaryllis, Passion Lips, and the Protea Flower. Our very first alter ego with a CE that has some bearing in history. Weird. 
The death of Ashia Dolman is something that is debated primarily because his body's whereabouts are unknown. In certain tales, he was killed by Abe no Seime after Dolman had murdered him, only for another magician to resurrect Seime and then trick Dolman, at which point Dolman was killed by Seime. Historically, though, it's important to know that many people feared Dolman's powers, so the likely cause of his death and lack of body is that he himself was murdered and then his body left out somewhere. The split along the skull would simply assure that he had no hopes of ever coming back. Enbar is the legendary steed of the god of the sea, Manan Maclear. It was said to be able to run just as easily on water as it could on land, and was as swift as the wind. While the horse itself belongs to Manan, it was often used by Lu as well, lent to him by the sea god. The horse, white as snow, was enchanted as well that its rider was unable to be killed, and possibly inspired the desire for a similar white horse amongst the ranks of the early Irish. Little side note, but Baz lists her type for marriage partner here, and let's just say she's got some pretty high expectations. Taisu is a somewhat complicated character to understand, because he is treated in both his Japanese and Chinese forms in F2O. He is a member of the tale The Investiture of the God, where he is tricked into assisting King Zhao of the Shang Dynasty, which ultimately leads to his death and then enshrinement. But in Japanese and some Chinese traditions, after this he is described as a lump of earth that, if disturbed, causes disasters. You can track this by following his star, which in actuality was the planet Jupiter. In essence, he had two bodies, one that lay beneath the earth and another in the heavens. This CE mentions how he craves to be in the heavens. That is, if I am understanding any of this correctly. I'll be honest, this one's got me kind of lost. From the description, this is meant to symbolize something along the lines of a gate opening for hero spirits to come from, but it is not explained well enough for me to fully get it. All I can say for certain is that in Fate lore, Bunyan taught heroes from across time how to make maple syrup. The life of Zhu Fu has an unknown conclusion to us in history, but in fate we are given the theory that they reached Japan and set up a colony where they would experiment with ways to make a potion of immortality. However, Zhu Fu seems to have invested too much into learning it herself and less of teaching her pupils, because this CE takes place as she lays dying, attempting to give her last rites only to constantly be correcting her students who are failing to understand her works. In other words, I don't have time to be dying. She's perfect. The death and story of Grigory Rasputin is one that is known the world over. He was poisoned with cakes and wines, and when these appeared to have no effect, he was shot several times, stood up, attacked his assailant, tried to run from the house, and then was shot again with a guaranteed fatal shot being one to the head. His body was then dumped into a river. There's a lot of debate as to whether Rasputin was evil or good, when in reality I think it's much more neutral. Rasputin was a peasant, and a lot of the supposed conspiracies that he supposedly whispered to the Empress were about keeping Russia out of the war because that would prevent peasants from dying. He was far from a good man, but was certainly an interesting figure in history. Go look up the story about how he walked from Russia to Greece to go to a Christian temple, saw all the men sleeping with each other, and then walked back to Russia. This is the scene of Tiamat's defeat at her hands during the Babylonia Singularity. Tiamat's initial death was one that made her feel abandoned. She was rejected by her children, her body torn asunder, and used to construct a new world where she was no longer needed. This time, however, when she was defeated, she knows that we didn't do it out of hatred for her or her creations, but rather to protect the world that we call home, which is a message that appears to have resonated within her. Rather than the calls for us not to leave her, she now wants us not to return, so that we may progress in a world that she could never live in. Go on and pour one out for Mama. The Silver Key is the name of a story by Lovecraft and very much resembles the Silver Key presented here. The key itself is believed to open a gate into the dream world. The issue with this is that the key is also the lock, but also the gate, and all are one together but also separate, as is the case when dealing with outer gods. The dragon of smoke escaping Mount Fuji along with the tiger in the snow are believed to be Hokusai's final completed paintings before his death. Hokusai claimed on his deathbed with his last words that if only he had five more years he would be a true artist. Hokusai was a prime example of a creator, someone who was never satisfied with what he had made and always wanted to improve. It's almost insane to think that someone who dies at the age of 88 still believed he had so much to learn and do. Truly inspirational. A letter and photo from X. This is one I really like because it's a reminder that we really don't summon her or the other servant for servants. They just kind of show up and do their own thing and then leave. The contract we have with them is more like an actual formal contract, but X has a job as a space police officer so she can't really show up all the time. This CE is nice though because it shows that she's thinking of us. Also, it's a nice little thing to think about, but even after we're done at Chaldea, we would still be able to be in contact with the Servantverse characters, which is really heartwarming. The flute was a popular instrument among the Chinese aristocrats. Jade is very famously popular in China, so the idea of a favored consort being given a flute made of extra rare jade is certainly within the realm of reason. I describe it as such because I couldn't find anything claiming that she actually owned a jade flute, but perhaps the idea that the celestial Chang'e gifted it to her makes up for this. 
The use of a celestial deity for Young here, giving her a gift, is rather fitting given that she herself is possessed by a celestial deity. The Titan 3E rocket was an expendable launch rocket used to put various probes into space. Voyager, of course, was one of these, but others included the Viking 1 and 2 probes. The real bulk of this CE comes from the question of how Voyager remembers this if it all happened before he was sentient, but he's a good boy so it doesn't matter. In a way, I am fascinated by the fact that they included this because of the undertone it carries with Lovecraft's other works and his general opinions and usage of Arabia in his works. The scimitar was a weapon used by Randolph Carter during his initial excursions into the dreamlands of unknown Kadath, though it would be later stolen away from him. This is not to be mistaken with an implement used by Alhazred. I fucking love Go. This is a self-portrait gifted to us from her after some time has been spent with us. She attempts to write to us in the style of Van Gogh, and the painting itself is that of her current manifestation rather than the proper Go, in the style of his Arles era paintings. Now, part of the reason I love this so much is that it shows that she's accepting herself for who she is now, which is a massive step up from when we first met. Second, this is historically accurate because Van Gogh was very fond of portrait painting. Third, she addresses how she has adopted the same habits of normal Van Gogh in her indulgence in coffee, overuse of paint, and perfectionism. It's great and I'm obligated to grail Go eventually. The most notable thing about this CE is that it is maybe the most realistically rendered one for no reason, and it's based on a Sony Walkman. This is A-Chan's mixtape, which she is giving to us. This is a pretty big deal given that normally first editions for stuff like this are memories that most musicians want to forget, so it really is something special to be given one. Dame Millet's medallion from the Dark Woods is just a huge reference to the Outer God possessing her. The Dark Woods and the Sign of the Ram are referencing her being the Black Goat of the Woods. The words written in all capitals are taken directly from the Necronomicon as the necessary incantation for summoning Pochi Sensei. This gives us the end goal of Koyan Sky of Dark. She wishes to save humanity by essentially making us 100% reliant on her products and to sacrifice our freedom. Her end goal is to preserve us and make us happy, but only by following exactly what she tells us to do. In other words, she's attempting to domesticate us because she views us as animals. Minor Lost Belt 7 spoilers, I think. The hairpin and jacket were initially a gift from us to Cuckoo when she couldn't afford it but wanted it, given back to us as a token to remember her by. At the very least, that's what I'm pulling up as I've not played through Lost Belt 7 yet. If this is the case, then it is a continuation in the long line of things given to us to remember a servant by even after they are gone. To me still, these are the most special bond CEs because there are few things more human than wanting to be remembered. Lost Belt 6 spoiler. This is Nock Nara, like the actual one from Lost Belt 6 who was poisoned and killed. If you may recall, Nock took quite a liking to us in Lost Belt 6 because of our actions in Steel Resolve, and afterward and afterwards during the events of Summer 8, her fondness for us grew. Further, after you've bonded with her deeply enough, she recites an oath which is implied to be the King Clan's equivalent of marriage vows. The crown itself is the equivalent to a wedding ring and its massive sizes because and I quote, it's the crown of a great fairy, it's supposed to be big, isn't it? Wangina Net is the Wangina's constantly active NP. This device is essentially a god's authority, but smaller in scale, and is one of the ways in which the Wangina is able to control water. In real life, this is likely what is used to explain various depictions of the Wangina having circles around their head. Massive Lost Belt 6 spoilers. Behold Blanca, the princess of the autumn woods and the only fairy who truly knew the nature of Oberon as Vortigern. Here she lays after being discarded by Oberon, having given her life-absorbing curses that would have killed him. This CE tells her tale of how she knew who he was and yet fell in love with him regardless, wanting only to stay by his side to the very end. I want to make something clear about this relationship, though. Where Oberon seems to uncaringly fling her away to the ground with no more pomp and circumstance than one tossing away a stick, the fact that he is incapable of telling the truth indicates his true intentions. That, at the very least, he did care for her, if only a little. I'm glad that she does return with him for some of his animations, so she gets to stay with her beloved. This one is much more flavor than anything else. This CE may seem familiar, and that is because it is the same scrap of mantle from Waver's Bond CE, only this one is less worn and torn, a gift to a trusted friend. For Hephaestion, this serves as a reminder that she had once failed in her protection of her king, this scrap being caused by a sword cleaving it away. The real Hephaestion as well was one of Iskander's closest advisors and friends, so this would make sense historically as a motivator to continue to protect the king. Proto Merlin's Bond CE is devoid of meaning for me, who has not played through this event, but even then, the idea of a final Bond CE being tied to a Paracel being lost is just an unusual choice. I suppose this is the fate of all summer CEs. The secret of this staff is that it is actually a heroic spirit. Shi Jin was another member of the 108 Stars of Destiny, ranked number 23 of the Heavenly Stars under the Minute Star. His weapon of choice was a staff, though not a segmented one as it appears here. His relevance to the story is that he was the very first member of the Stars of Destiny to be introduced in the novel. The reason why he had nine dragons tattooed on his body 
was to appear stronger and more awe-inspiring in battle. Aztalan is the original land of the Aztec people. At some point, the god Huitzpactli demanded that the Aztec people to find a new land to move to and no longer call themselves Azteca, but rather Mexica. They traveled for several years and eventually settled in an area of Lake Texcoco, which is in modern-day Mexico City. The Azteca were believed to have migrated south from the north for this journey. The idea behind the CE in game appears to be Tlaloc trying to convince us to move in with her in an ideal house for a couple to raise a family. So, you know. This one is difficult for a number of reasons, but Summer Bob appears to have made a dojin about the experiences of the Rain Witch. Now, translating the CE reads that the Rain Witch in question is not actually herself, as the cover would show, but rather about the real Rain Witch, Ash the Savior. However, due to embarrassment, she has opted to use herself as a model and tell that particular witch's story through this motif. Our final Bond CE, Aestis Estus, translated roughly to the Tide of Being. Mother Harlot possesses no such weapon, and neither does the Great Beast 666. The design, however, appears as though Nero's own sword has finally been fully completed. This one almost reads closer to an Avenger weapon, one fueled by her anguish and loneliness at dying alone. It's a bit of a disappointment to end this series on a Bonsai that lacks real-world lore, but such is fate, I suppose. And that is it, the conclusion of explaining the lore of the Bonsai's. I will maybe keep this list updated as I see fit, adding the servants of the previous year to the lineup. For now though, thank you all so much for watching. Do all the YouTube stuff, check my links for my Discord, Twitch, and Twitter. But for now guys, keep your chin up. Peace.